election was stolen. That lie, they argue, led thousands to storm the Capitol. The suspected target for many that day was Trump's own vice president, Mike Pence. Chants of hang Mike Pence were heard during the rally outside and by rioters inside. Videos from the day show the vice president and his family being rushed to safety. And that is what the committee hopes to prove today, that President Trump tried to pressure the vice president to overturn the election. And when he failed to do so, the president spurred on the uprising. That was how the Republican co-chair of chair of the committee, Liz Cheney, teased their findings ahead of today's hearing. Today we're going to. And we're also going to hear live from a top Pence aide who was with him when they were rushed to safety on January 6th. We want to begin right now with our senior Capitol Hill correspondent, Garrett Hake, who is outside the hearing room for a preview of what's ahead. Garrett, good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Lester. The committee intends to show here that this pressure campaign against Mike Pence began in December and was both more pervasive and more dangerous to the vice president than has been previously reported. They will introduce the country to a man named John Eastman, who was a White House lawyer, who they say is the one who came up with this idea that Pence could somehow unilaterally reject the election results on January 6th. And they'll make the case that as each court challenge, each legal avenue to President Trump closed, the pressure on Pence got ratcheted up more and more and more, leading up to a phone call on the morning of the 6th in which the president lays into Pence and makes his case that Pence has to do this. Pence ultimately rejects that from uh, President Trump. And then as the assault on the Capitol is underway, President Trump tweets even further. Yesterday, I had a chance to talk to Pete Aguilar, who's the California congressman who's going to be leading today's hearing, and he described that pivotal moment to me. I mean, he's right up there in his ceremonial office. What's going on out here and what's happening in that room with the vice president? You know, at that time, the, the vice president had already been evacuated. There were bike racks out here uh, that had been breached. So the rioters had actually breached the first line of defense. They were getting closer and closer. 2.13 p.m., they breached the building. Uh, at 2.24 p.m., the president puts out a tweet that Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what was necessary. And, and so we have the vice president one window pane away from the, from the mob here. And so that's when they knew it was time to evacuate. And so Lester, the committee intends to describe and show never before seen images of Pence deep in the bowels of the Capitol on that day, trying to go on with the business of governing and making the point that he could not leave. They had to finish the count on that night as they ultimately did. The committee's going to hold Pence up today as someone who stood up for his constitutional responsibility, even in the face of enormous pressure from President Trump. All right, Gary, we'll be talking to you along the way. I'm joined here by my colleagues, NBC political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, and by our chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker. Great to have you both here. Uh, Chuck, let me start with you. Uh, how do Republicans react as, as they watch this play out and see the former vice president really held up as essentially a target? This, to me, is what I'm watching for. You know, look, there are different ways that I'm sort of judging the impact of these hearings. One of them, one of the ways I'm not judging it is on the midterm elections. I think that's sort of a silly barometer for now. I think this is a sort of a, a the, the first step to see how effective these hearings are, whether it starts to penetrate uh, folks who have not wanted to acknowledge the seriousness of what happened on January 6th. You know, we saw, I remember right after um, they voted on impeachment, we were like, Tom Rice, who's Tom Rice? He voted for impeachment. It was a South Carolina Republican at the time that people didn't know who were surprised. In fact, some people thought, oh, this must be a mistake. The point was there were people you didn't expect who said, whoa, this is a bridge too far. The story of the, of, of the pressure campaign of Mike Pence is one that I don't think has been told very well uh, yet. I, I, I think they're going to tell it pretty well today. And I'm very curious to see the elected Republicans, mainstream Republicans, how they handle this. Can they really continue to walk this line of not condemning Trump, condemning the actions, all this stuff, when they see that Mike Pence was could have been killed.
mm. on January 6th. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a chilling thing to say. It's a chilling thing, I think, that we're going to hear today. And I'm very curious to see how elected Republicans handle this. I think there'll be some that break. What breaking looks like is, 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 is open for interpretation. But I think this, that's how I'm watching to see how effective they are today. If they're as effective as I expect them to be, I expect some prominent Republicans to say, you know what? This was too much. It's time for Trump to go. There's, there's no, I mean, the, the, the shot of him being whisked, the vice president being whisked to safety away from other Americans certainly was, was chilling. Uh, Kristen, let me get your thoughts uh, before we begin here. Well, as Chuck notes, there were so many gaps that day that we just don't know about. One of them was this 15-minute phone call that occurred between former President Trump, former Vice President Mike Pence, the morning of January 6th. What specifically was said in that call? I think we're going to get new details about that. We're going to see new video. We're going to hear from Mark Short, one of his top aides who testified um, under oath on videotape, so he's not going to be a live witness, but I think that hearing what he has to say, listening to it, could be very impactful. And then I'm also told that we're going to see new images, what I'm told are stark photos behind the scenes of former Vice President Mike Pence on that day. So all of this, I think, just underscores the point that you just heard from Chuck. This could really impact some Republicans who may not have thought this was a huge deal. So I think all of that is going to be significant. What is former Vi Vice President President Mike Pence doing today. He's in Ohio campaigning with Governor Mike DeWine. He's trying to at least optically show that he's focused on the future. But I spoke with um, a, tr a Pence aide who said, look, there's been a heaviness inside Pence world since January 6th. And there's also a sense of pride. And I think that's all going to be on display today. One more note. Chuck brings up Tom Rice. He was just defeated in his bid for re-election, so it underscores the fact that you just can't survive. I'll tell you, though, in talking with some Pence people, Lester, there's a sense of liberation mm -hmm. that they feel, that they don't, this, this, this constant, and a lot of other Republicans, you know, you feel as if you can't, you can't make Trump mad, but you're not comfortable with this. In some ways, you know, they're, they went all in. They went all in. Look, th this is what we experienced. They told their story here today. I think it's going to be pretty. Well, starting with the, the first hearing, Pence president. was held up almost as a hero. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the end, he did what the Constitution required him to do. Does does he deserve the accolades? Uh, look, we're gonna. I, I think. Uh, <sighs> It, it, I think, yes, I do. I think that there's, I understand whether, you know, look, he, he certainly, uh, it, some would argue he accepted the premise of the arguments for quite a bit of time before he came down on the side that he came down on. So for some people that might might think, oh, well, he, he just, he waited till the last minute. But, you know, I think in hindsight, it turned out this was a braver move than I think anybody appreciated. I want to, to bring fair. in uh, Yamish Allison to our, our NBC News Washington correspondent. Yamish, let's discuss the potential political fallout of today's hearing, which will focus on the former vice president. It's a difficult balancing act and ahead for Mike Pence trying to win over Trump supporters with an eye on the 2024 elections, as we were discussing here now. How does this all play out? Well, Lester, in talking to people who are close to Vice President Pence and former Vice President Pence, they tell me that this hearing is going to be about his resolve and his reverence for the Constitution. They're very proud of the fact that on that day, Mike Pence decided not only to go with what legal experts were telling him to do, which is certify the election, but also that he didn't get in the car when he was given the option of fleeing the Capitol. And it's that decision that, that a lot of Pence aides tell me they hope will, it will help him in his political bids. They understand that this is a, a real risk, that he's taking a political risk to break from what is, of course, a very popular former President Trump. But they also feel as though there is a lane for former Vice President Mike Pence to run in, because they're looking specifically at Georgia and Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger, two men who were targeted by former, former President um, Trump because they did not want to overturn the election in Georgia. They say that those two men being able to have victories in their primaries means that maybe Mike Pence can win over people who want Trump policies but don't want the brash style and certainly don't want the election lies. So I'm told by someone who's very close to Mike Pence that he feels as though there is this lane for him. And also they say, if you watch 
watch Mike Pence on the campaign trail or on the trail or when he's traveling, um, that he doesn't really talk about January 6th. He wants to move on. He does see it as something that was a stain on American democracy, but he also wants to talk more about policies, about the economy. And he says specifically that he is still proud of his service with former President Trump, that really he was a loyal partner to President Trump. So there are a lot of political risks that he's taking, but he also really does see his future as still being bright, Lester. All right, Yamish, thank you. We'll ask you to stand by. Let me bring Garrett back in the conversation. Garrett, there's a name we may or may not hear today, but one that will be in the room in some way or another. That's Jenny Thomas, the wife of the Supreme Court Justice. There's been a lot of news breaking on this over the last day. Tell us about it. Yeah, Lester, the Washington Post reporting overnight that Ginny Thomas was someone who had engaged in an email back and forth with the White House lawyer John Eastman, who I mentioned earlier. The Post reporting that Thomas was encouraging of Eastman and vice versa on this scheme to set aside the election results and keep Donald Trump in power. The committee had been aware of Thomas's uh, activism around this issue broadly, but it appears only more recently became aware of these specific correspondences with Eastman. Um, now the committee chair and vice chair have told reporters today that they do intend to ask Thomas to come and testify before them sometime in the next few weeks. The, the committee's position on Thomas had long been that she wasn't central to what they were investigating. Again, they sort of knew she was a periphery figure here. She had texted with uh, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows at the time. They were well aware of that. But they didn't think she was key to this. I think prodded perhaps by some of this reporting by the Washington Post, they now feel as though she's someone it would be important for them to talk to. And you know, really, this breaks along two separate axes, politically speaking, both the involvement here directly in the investigation and what, if anything, she might have discussed with her husband, the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. The two have long said that they keep their political work separate, but obviously any election-related cases that might come before the Supreme Court or any of those who already have, uh, if Ginny Thomas is involved somehow behind the scenes on the Trump side of things, it potentially complicates Clarence Thomas's role. So the committee now acknowledging this is something they're going to have to delve into. All right, Garrett, thanks. And Kristen, there have been moments in, this, in the January 6th hearings, you have to kind of stand back and, and look at where we are. Your draw almost drops. Uh, when, when you, we, we've got a Supreme Court justice's wife now, right. if not at the center of this, certainly a, a key figure. Once again, we're kind of standing back on our heels. And it's just extraordinary to learn that she was in touch with officials in Arizona. She was uh, in touch with Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. And now we're learning she was in touch with John Eastman. He is going to emerge, I think, as a central figure today. This was a conservative lawyer who was advising former President Trump that, yes, Mike Pence had the authority to reject and appoint new electors, which is just not the case. Um, and, and the fact that she was in contact with him and with these other officials, I, I think goes back to the point that you were discussing with Chuck, which is how will history view Mike Pence? Think about how many voices were in his ear telling him to try to block or overturn the results of this election. And ultimately, he held the line. And I think she is one more data point. She's one more figure who was adding to that pressure campaign. And Chuck, back to Pence, we're going we're gonna to hear there was no communication. The president wasn't calling him during all this. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to worry about his welfare at all. Meaning while Pence is the one communicating with General Milley. Pence is the one trying to uh, find out how can we get more resources to, to sort of help with the siege. Nothing from the president at all. I think that's going to be a big moment here. I'll tell you, this Ginny Thomas stuff, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of people, including in Republican circles, sort of write Ginny Thomas off as sort of, hey, she's, she's out there, but she's an activist. she got to sort of appease her or, or whatever it is. And I think folks didn't sort of take her missives very seriously. And then you realize she found and potentially found an ear or potentially found a in, in John Eastman here. I think this this could be making the Jenny Thomas role a lot more serious than I think a lot of I think a lot of people say, well, she's kind of she's she's just kind of a, an aggressive activist on the right and seems to be always a, a bit overzealous. Now it starts to look like that may she have, may have stumbled into this conspiracy. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst and criminal defense attorney Danny Savalos. There is talk about, Danny, you know, possible criminal charges stemming from the January 6th committee's investigation. What have you seen so far and what are you looking forward to as, as obviously the Justice Department is making those kinds of decisions? Today, what we'll be looking forward to is evidence that 
Eastman and Trump knew what they were doing was wrong and yet persisted in a pressure campaign against Vice President Pence. Because arguably then you're getting into the area of conspiracy to obstruct a, an official proceeding, to wit the uh, counting and certifying of the electoral, uh, the electors from the different states. And so that's what the panel should focus on at least today, uh, because they should avoid the sensational, avoid too much time on gallows and hang Mike Pence, because because we have a robust history of First Amendment defenses, and burning people in effigy is part of that First Amendment protection. Instead, focus on things like the meeting with Eastman and Pence's team in the White House, where Eastman pushes this theory, but yet apparently conceded that it was against historical practice, would be rejected by the Supreme Court, and was in violation of the Electoral Count Act. That shows intent potentially criminal intent to do something that they knew was wrong. And that's the kind of thing the panel should be focused on. We're probably going to get that from Greg Jacob, who's going to be a compelling witness today, Lester. Is that the thread we're going to watch for throughout the entire hearings as to what Donald Trump knew, what his state of mind was, what he had said? Yes, because Greg Jacob, in terms of a witness today, is the most direct form of evidence about what Eastman knew and then, by implication, what uh, the president knew. Now, Judge Luddig is a very interesting witness. You're going to hear about how, in the middle of the night almost, or early morning, he gets a call and composes a tweet on Twitter <coughs> with little knowledge of Twitter, had to call his son to ask <laughs> How the heck do I do Twitter? How do I make a long tweet? Uh, and had to work through it and ended up tweeting something out that the vice president then used in his letter to the nation. Important stuff, but doesn't really go to what Eastman and Trump knew and when they knew it, specifically about how far-fetched their theory was and the pressure campaign that they nonetheless brought to bear against Mike Pence to either reject electors or delay the count. If the committee can prove or establish in the American psyche that this was something that Eastman and Trump knew was wrong when they did it, knew was hopeless, uh, then arguably you're starting to make out the elements of a conspiracy uh, against the United States to obstruct an official proceeding. Uh, that's really going to be and should be their focus today. All right, Kristen. Well, and, and I think that that is why filling in some of these blanks is going to be so critical. That 15 minute phone call, for example, what specifically was Trump's mindset? What did he know? Did he know ultimately? Yes, there were a course of voices telling him that these election results could not be overturned. And yet, this one person was telling him that the vice president had the authority to do exactly that. I do think that Greg Jacob is going to be the person to watch today. He was the person who was advising the former vice president most closely. Ludig helped him kind of in an informal role toward the end, and as you just heard from Danny Savalos, craft um, that statement. But I think that Greg Jacob was the person who was in the room in those really tough moments, really trying to get him to hold the line, to realize that he did not have the authority to go beyond simply a role of uh, really going into January 6 um, as a symbolic role. He didn't have the authority to appoint new electors. By the way, we're going to see some interesting moments uh, that are sort of interspersed of moments that will feel familiar to us. So, for instance, uh, Donald Trump was at a rally in Georgia the day before mm. January 6. Yep. And you can now some of his comments that he was making, alluding to what Pence could do and all this or that, now you understand what was happening sort of in the moments before he took the podium and just talked about those things just out of Georgia. I mean, we're starting to understand there were always these extraneous comments that Trump would say in public or even tweet. And, and what this committee has done so well is put together the timeline right before those moments so to explain this is what was in the former president's head mm -hmm. at the time. So we are we are learning that they, they and I think this is the timeline that Greg Jacob is going to be able to point out. And it, it is, you know, what I expect the committee to do pretty well is be able to show you. And then th here's what the president was saying in the public, applying this pressure. I mean, he was doing public pressure. He was doing private pressure. You know, all of it, which, of course, culminated with the riot on January 6th. Well, I, about, okay. I, I think it's worth noting, and Chuck makes me think of this, the choreography of the day, which is that the first part of the hearing is going to focus on those days leading up to January 6th to try to connect those dots. Yes. And then the second the second part of the hearing is really going to focus on January 6th itself, creating a timeline of events um, and creating essentially 
pulling back the curtain on that moment that the vice president was evacuated and in hiding. And again, I think that's where some of those new stark images are going to come. We're about in. 10 minutes away from the uh, start of this third hearing, uh, the January 6th committee hearing. Let me uh, bring in right now NBC's Vaughn Hilliard, who has been in contact with former aides to the vice president. Vaughn, how do those aides view this moment uh, and, and how this, this committee is working this along to a conclusion? Right. I think it's important, Lester, that we note as we watch this hearing unfold these next hours is the fact that the VP's office are all cooperating with this investigation by the January 6th Select Committee. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we're talking about uh, officials who have been subpoenaed, each of them agreed to testify, as opposed to some who were uh, more aligned with Donald Trump, who have tried to fight their subpoenas, as well as members of Congress. Each of these advisors has gone and sat down with the January 6th committee and agreed to these depositions, as well as the VP's office never trying to exert uh, this idea of vice presidential executive privilege, like you saw Donald Trump try to do with White House documents. They turned over to the January 6th committee all of the documents that were requested of them here. I think that is an important construct in which we need to view this hearing through. But the other part of this is when you're talking about that timeline. In my conversation here, you know, there was the aide who was outlining to me uh, yesterday that important 15-minute phone call that Kristen is talking about. It took place when Mike Pence, on the morning of January 6th, was still at the Naval Observatory, the vice president's residence. Multiple senior advisors were with Pence there at the Naval Observatory. Instead of going to the White House, he stayed there. That is when Donald Trump placed a phone call to him. It lasted, I'm told, about 15 minutes. The exact nature and exactly what was spoken between the two men during those 15 minutes is what is still unclear and what potentially we could learn more and understand more about here in these hours ahead. Why? Well, the vice president, you know, I've covered him for years now, and whenever I asked him what about a conversation between him and Donald Trump, Trump, he'd always tell me that is private. That is between the vice president and the president. But in this situation, it wasn't the vice president who others were listening in on. But we are told that the January 6th committee uh, has depositions and testimony from individuals inside of the West Wing who were listening in on Donald Trump's side of the phone call. Now, exactly what they are able to offer up is what went back between those two and those hours before Mike Pence then headed to the Capitol. That is still a question mark. You know, the the other thing to note is where Chuck was talking about the communication here. When we're talking about the pressure campaign, this was not just the life of Mike Pence that was on the line. This was the vice president, Mike Pence, who had a constitutional obligation under the Electoral Count Act to oversee the certification of the 2020 election that very day. And when we talk about him going from a hold room, then down to a parking tunnel here, we are talking about the potential that the peaceful transfer of power was going to be held up. And Donald Trump never placed a phone call to Mike Pence. And I actually talked with Mark Short, uh, Pence's chief of staff, yesterday as well. And I asked him, well, did the vice president ever place a phone call to Donald Trump? And his quote to me was, why would he? Pence was focused on the security of the Capitol complex, the safety of people, and ultimately that certification. And that is why, when we're talking about this pressure campaign, there was not only a danger, a threat to Pence and his family and his aides, but also there was a threat to a transfer of power not taking place there in those final two weeks before Inauguration Day. All right, Vaughn Hilliard with uh, the hearing from the ground from the uh, Pence folks as the former vice president becomes the center now of this third hearing. Remember, the schedule got moved around a little bit uh, for logistics, but we are about to pick up again uh, with the third in a series of hearings uh, focused on January 6th, how we got there, and as we keep using the term, connecting the dots. We're going to pause here for just a moment to give our NBC stations a chance to join our special coverage of the January 6th Select Committee here. Eric's. This is an NBC News special report. The results of a year-long investigation into the January 6th attack. Day three of the unprecedented congressional hearings. Today, the threats against Vice President Mike Pence. As rioters stormed the halls of Congress, 
the January 6th committee promising new details on President Trump's pressure campaign against him as they try to prove that the former president was responsible for the assault on the Capitol. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. New evidence set to be revealed today as the January 6th committee makes its case to the American people. Here now is Lester Holt. Good day, everyone, from New York at State 3 of the historic January 6th hearings. The committee has so far been focused on President Trump and how he spent weeks relentlessly promoting the false claim that the election was stolen. That lie, the committee believes, fueled the anger that drove thousands to overrun Capitol Police and ransacked the halls of Congress. Today, they'll argue that the president helped focus that anger on one man, his vice president, Mike Pence. As they stormed the Capitol, rioters chanted, hang Mike Pence. There's video of the vice president and his family being rushed to safety as they closed in. Today, we're going to hear live from a top Pence aide who was with him in those moments, and we're likely to hear tape testimony from President Trump's advisors about the weeks-long pressure campaign in private and in public that President Trump waged against his VP to convince him to overturn the election results. We want to warn you that some of the videos the committee will play will contain explicit language. Let's get right to NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig, who's just outside the hearing room and will set the stage for us. Garrett. Lester, today we're going to see a timeline laid out that starts in mid-December and goes all the way up through January 6th, in which time, as every legal challenge the president was trying to make to stop the election certification was failing, pressure was growing inside the White House on the vice president to use what amounted to an illegal scheme to set aside the election results on January 6th. The committee will introduce us to a man named John Eastman, a White House attorney who came up with this idea. And while it was his idea, the committee will make it clear it was Donald Trump who applied the pressure to Mike Pence, whether it be in public speeches or in private phone calls. For weeks leading up to the 6th itself, the president increased the pressure on Pence, including in a phone call on the morning of the 6th that we will hear described by aides who heard it. We will also hear exactly how close Mike Pence came to the mob once they broke into the Capitol. And Donald Trump tweeted about Pence not having the courage, as he put it, to go through with the plan and we will see the effort Pence took to stay in the Capitol complex and resume and ultimately complete the counting of votes on election night. The committee members I spoke to see Pence as a sympathetic figure here who did everything he could in the face of that enormous pressure to make sure the Constitution was followed on January 6th. Garrett, thank you. I'm joined here by my colleagues, NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, and by our chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker. Chuck, I'll start with you. Will we see a team normal moment here? Is this going to be a, <laughs> a, normal, a, a, yeah. a split? Look, I, I think it is. Uh, look, this is uh, w the way I'm measuring the success of this hearing really is going to be how many elected Republicans who have who've been reticent to criticize uh, former President Trump uh, for his actions on January 6th, maybe beyond just those the initial day, week or two after the attack itself on the Capitol, uh, when they hear the full story of the pressure campaign against Mike Pence, not just how close he came to danger, personal danger, on January 6th, but everything in the run-up to it, uh, it, it it's going to paint a pretty damning picture. Uh, and, and look, I, I, a lot of people want to look towards November to see if they measure success or failure in this hearings. To me, it's more of a measure of how many more people understand and agree on, uh, on the actual set of facts that happen. And I think if these hearings are as effective as I think they could be today, I think you'll see some prominent Republicans who maybe have not been critical of the former president say, you know what, it's time to move on. He did real damage to this country. Look what he did to Mike Pence. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be a rush of Republicans. but. I think you'll see a lot of them think this privately. And I just wonder, in, in the wake of today's facts, will some of them say, you know what, I'm off the Trump train. And that's one measure I'm looking forward to see how effective these hearings are. Kristen, what are your thoughts as we uh, begin? Well, I think that today is about filling in a lot of the blanks in the days leading up to January 6th and January 6th itself as it relates to the pressure campaign against former Vice President Mike Pence. As you heard Garrett mention, we are going to learn new details about that 15-minute phone call that Pence had with Trump on the morning of January 6th before he went to the Capitol. We are going to see new video, and I'm told we are going 
going to get new images of the former vice president behind the scene, particularly when he was essentially in hiding as the rioters were storming the Capitol. I'm told that those images are stark, and I think that could have the type of impact that Chuck is talking about. Broadly speaking, I've been talking to aides who are close to Mike Pence, and I've asked them if there's a heaviness as they approach this day, as they expect to relive that day, essentially. And they say, look, there's really been a heaviness since January 6th that has been embedded inside Trump world. At the same time, where is the former vice president today? He's going to be in Ohio campaigning with Governor DeWine there. He's at least optically trying to look to the future, trying to focus on what's ahead. But there is no doubt this is a very heavy day. But one aide said to me they are also filled with a lot of pride that the former vice president held the line that day and the nation's democracy held. Because you know, Lester, one, one quick thing. I, I was talking to uh, Pence folks also feel a little bit liberated by today. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of speculation. What do they say? What have they said? What, in some ways, this is a cathartic moment for them. Get this done. It's all mm -hmm. out there. Now there's no more mystery about Oh, what, what did they do but maybe they want to the keep scene. their silence? As, no, as well, I think they out. view that they had been keeping their silence. This is the public record. So in some ways, it's all out there. It is notable to me who Mike Pence hangs with, though. Mike DeWine, governor of Ohio, mm -hmm. Trump critic. Mm -hmm. Not somebody and who has beat back a, a Trump uh, primary challenger. Uh, and so he, you know, Pence knows where he has allies in the party. And it is people like Pence, uh, excuse me, uh, DeWine and uh, Brian Kemp in a, in a Georgia. All right, the gavel has fallen. The uh, third session of the uh, hearings by the January 6th committee underway. Now. Select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol will be in order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. Pursuant to House Deposition Authority Regulation 10, the chair announces the committee's approval to release the deposition material represented during today's hearing. Good afternoon. This is almost no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. No idea more un-American. I agree with that, which is unusual, because former Vice President Mike Pence and I don't agree on much. These are his words, spoken a few months ago about Donald Trump's attempt to pressure the former vice president, pressure him into going along with an unlawful and unconstitutional scheme to overturn the 2020 election and give Donald Trump a second term in office that he did not win. Today, the select committee is going to reveal the details of that pressure campaign. But what does the vice president of the United States even have to do with a presidential election? The Constitution says that the vice president of the United States oversees the process of counting the electoral college votes, a process that took place on January 6, 2021. Donald Trump wanted Mike Pence to do something no other vice president has ever done. The former president wanted Pence to reject the votes and either declare Trump the winner or send the votes back to the states to be counted again. Mike Pence said no. He resisted the pressure. He knew it was illegal. He knew it was wrong. We are fortunate for Mr. Pence's courage on January 6th. Our democracy came dangerously close to catastrophe. That courage put him in tremendous danger. When Mike Pence made it clear that he wouldn't give in to Donald Trump's scheme, Donald Trump turned the mob on him, a mob that was chanting, hang Mike Pence, a mob that had built a hangman's gallows just outside the Capitol. Thanks in part to Mike Pence, our democracy withstood Donald Trump's scheme and the violence of January 6th. But the danger hasn't receded. Led by my colleague, Mr. Aguilar, today we'll lay out the facts for the American people. But first, I recognize my colleague from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney, 
for any opening statement she care to offer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me take just a few minutes today to put the topic of our hearing in broader context. In our last hearing, we heard unequivocal testimony that President Trump was told his election fraud allegations were complete nonsense. We heard this from members of the Trump campaign. We heard this from President Trump's campaign lawyers. We heard this from President Trump's former Attorney General, Bill Barr. We heard this from President Trump's former Acting Attorney General, Jeff Rosen. And we heard this from President Trump's former Acting Deputy Attorney General, Richard Donahue. We heard from members of President Trump's White House staff as well. Today, we're focusing on President Trump's relentless effort to pressure Mike Pence to refuse to count electoral votes on January 6th. Here again is how the former vice president phrased it in a speech before the Federalist Society, a group of conservative lawyers. For this week, the President Trump said I had the right to overturn the election. But President Trump is wrong. I had no right to overturn the election. The presidency belongs to the American people and the American people alone. And frankly, there is no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. What the president wanted the vice president to do was not just wrong. It was illegal and unconstitutional. We will hear many details in today's hearing, but please consider these two points. First, President Trump was told repeatedly that Mike Pence lacked the constitutional and legal authority to do what President Trump was demanding he do. This is testimony from Mark Short, the Vice President's Chief of Staff, who served in the Trump administration in multiple positions over four years. But just to pick up on that, Mr. Short, is it, was it your impression that the Vice President had directly conveyed his position on these issues to the President, not just to the world through a dear colleague letter, but directly to President Trump? Many times. And had been consistent in conveying his position to the President? Very consistent. Okay. But President Trump plotted with a lawyer named John Eastman to pressure Pence to do so anyway. As the federal court has explained, quote, based on the evidence, the court finds that it is more likely than not that President Trump and Dr. Eastman dishonestly conspired to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. What exactly did President Trump know? When exactly did President Trump know that it would be illegal for Mike Pence to refuse to count electoral votes? Here is one sample of testimony given by one of the witnesses before us today, the Vice President's General Counsel. Did John Eastman ever admit, as far as you know, in front of the President that his proposal would violate the Electoral Count Act? Uh, I believe he did on the 4th. Okay. That was January 4th, two days before the attack on Congress. A second point, please listen to testimony today about all of the ways that President Trump attempted to pressure Vice President Pence, including Donald Trump's tweet at 2.24 p.m. condemning Vice President Mike Pence when President Trump already knew a violent riot was underway at the Capitol. In future hearings, you will hear from witnesses who were present inside the White House, who were present inside the West Wing, on that day. But today we focus on the earnest efforts of Mike Pence, who was determined to abide by his oath of office. As Vice President Pence prepared a statement on January 5th and 6th, explaining that he could not illegally refuse to count electoral votes, he said this to his staff. I mean, the Vice President had said, this may be the most important thing I ever said. And so, this okay. meaning the statement? The statement. And he really wanted to make sure that it was just so. You will hear today that President Trump's White House counsel believed that the Vice President did exactly the right thing on January 6th, as did others in the White House, as did Fox News host Sean Hannity. 
Vice President Pence understood that his oath of office was more important than his loyalty to Donald Trump. He did his duty. President Trump unequivocally did not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Without objection, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, we intend to show the American people that January 6th was not an isolated incident. In the weeks culminating before, it was a legal scheme and deception. We've already learned that President Trump knew he lost the 2020 election. Shortly after, he began to look for a way to circumvent our country's most fundamental civic tradition, the peaceful transfer of power. The president latched on to a dangerous theory and would not let go because he was convinced it would keep him in office. We witnessed firsthand what happened when the president of the United States weaponized this theory. The Capitol was overrun, police officers lost their lives, and the vice president was taken to a secure location because his safety was in jeopardy. Let's take a look at the effect of Donald Trump's words and actions. I want to warn our audience that the video contains explicit content. Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us, and if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. And Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution and for the good of our country. And if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you, I will tell you right now. I'm telling you what, I'm hearing the Pence. I hear the Pence just caved. No. Is that true? I didn't I'm hear. I'm hearing no. reports the Pence caved. No. I'm way. telling you, if Pence caved, we're gonna drag motherfuckers through the streets. You fucking politicians are gonna get fucking drugged through the streets. Yeah. I guess the hope is that there's such a show of force here that Pence will decide to just do the right job. thing, according to Trump. How did we get to this point? How did we get to the point where President Trump's most radical supporters led a violent attack on the Capitol and threatened to hang President Trump's own vice president? You'll hear from witnesses that Donald Trump pressured Mike Pence to adopt a legally and morally bankrupt idea that the vice president could choose who the next president can be. You'll hear about how the vice president, the White House counsel, and others told Donald Trump that the vice president had no such authority. But President Trump would not listen. You'll hear how Vice President Pence withstood an onslaught of pressure from President Trump, both publicly and privately, a pressure campaign that built to a fever pitch with a heated phone call on January 6th. You'll also hear that the president knew there was a violent mob at the Capitol when he tweeted at 2.24 p.m that the vice president did not have the, quote, courage to do what needed to be done. Let me be clear. Vice President Pence did the right thing that day. He stayed true to his oath to protect and defend the Constitution. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses this afternoon. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. We are honored to have two distinguished witnesses who advised Vice President regarding his role on January 6th. Judge J. Michael Ludick is one of the leading conservative legal thinkers in the country. He served in administrations of President Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. He was appointed by the latter to serve on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, where he served from 1991 to 2006. He provided critical advice for Vice President Pence regarding the role of the Vice President in the joint session of Congress shortly before that fateful moment. He's written that the Vice President does not have the power to select the next President of the United States. 
He's also written that, con that contrary theory espoused by one of his own former law clerks was, quote, incorrect at every turn. We also joined today by one of the people who was with Vice President Pence on January 6th. Greg Jacob was counsel to Vice President Pence. He conducted a thorough analysis of the role of the Vice President in the joint session of Congress under the Constitution, the Electoral Count Act, and 230 years of historical practice. But he also has firsthand information about the attack on the Capitol because he lived through it. He was with vi the Vice President and his own life was in danger. I will now swear in our witnesses. The witnesses will please stand and raise their right hand. Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you, you may be seated. Let the record reflect the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I now recognize myself for questions. In the United States, the people choose our representatives, including the highest official in the land, the President of the United States. The American people did this on November 3rd, 2020. But President Trump did not like the outcome. He did everything he could to change the result of the election. He tried litigation, 62 cases in fact, and that failed. He tried to pressure state legislatures to reverse the results of the election in their states, but they refused. He tried to enlist the Department of Justice in his efforts to overturn election results, but officials leading the department refused to comply. So eventually, he latched on to a completely nonsensical and anti-democratic theory that one man, his own vice president, could determine the outcome of the election. He wanted the vice president to unilaterally select the president. This theory that the vice president could unilaterally select the president runs completely contrary to our Constitution, our laws, and the entirety of our American experience. But that didn't stop, uh, didn't matter to President Trump. I would now like to explore how President Trump came to latch on to this ridiculous legal theory that the vice president can select the president of the United States. Mr. Jacob, how did this theory first come to your attention? The first time that I had a conversation with the Vice President about the 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act was in early December, around December 7th. Uh, the Vice President called me over to his West Wing office and told me that he had been seeing and reading things that suggested that he had a significant role to play uh, on January 6th uh, in announcing the outcome of the election. He told me that he had been first elected to Congress in 2000 and that one of his earliest memories as a congressman was sitting in on the 2001 certification um, and he recalled that Al Gore had gaveled down a number of objections that had been raised to Florida. And he asked me um, mechanically, how does this work at the joint session, what are the rules? And I told the Vice President that, um, in fact, I had a fairly good idea of how things work, that actually there aren't rules that govern the joint session, but what there is, is a, a provision of the Constitution that's just one sentence long, and then an Electoral Count Act that had been passed in 1887. And I told the Vice President that I could put a memo together for him overnight that would explain the applicable rules. So, Mr. Jacobs, when you looked at this theory, what did you conclude? So, we concluded that what you have is a sentence in the Constitution that is inartfully drafted. 
But the vice president's first instinct when he heard this theory was that there was no way that our framers, who abhorred concentrated power, who had broken away from the tyranny of George III, would ever have put one person, particularly not a person who had a direct interest in the outcome because they were on the ticket for the election, in a role to have decisive uh, impact on the outcome of the election. And our review of text, history, um, and frankly, just common sense all confirmed the vice president's first instinct on that point. There is no uh, justifiable basis to conclude that the vice president has that kind of authority. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Uh, we will hear more today about how, despite this conclusion by you and other top legal advisors, the former president used this discredited theory in his campaign to pressure the vice president to decide the outcome of the presidential election. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney, for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Ludig, thank you uh, as well for being here with us today. Um, you um, ha issued a very important statement earlier today, uh, which uh, I urge all Americans to read. A and I'd like to ask you, Judge, about um, one of the sentences in your statement and ask if you could explain to us um, the significance of it. Uh, you say, had the Vice President of the United States obeyed the President of the United States, America would immediately have been plunged into what would have been tantamount to a revolution within a paralyzing constitutional crisis. Could you elaborate on that for us, Judge? Thank you, um, Madam Vice Chairman. Um, that, that passage in, in my statement this morning um, referenced the, the most foundational concept in America, which is the rule of law. Thus, as I interpret your question, you are asking about uh, that foundational truth of these United States, which we call America. The foundational truth is the rule of law. That foundational truth is for the United States of America the profound truth. But it's not merely the profound truth for the United States it's also the simple truth, the simple foundational truth of the American Republic. Thus, in my view, uh, the hearings being conducted by this select committee are examining that profound truth, namely the rule of law in the United States of America. The specific question, of course, before you and before the nation, not before me, is whether that foundational rule of law was supremely violated on January 6, 2021. 
Now, to the question specifically that you asked, Madam Vice Chair, I believe that had Vice President Pence obeyed the orders from his president and the president of the United States of America during the joint session of the Congress of the United States on January 6, 2021 and declared Donald Trump the next president of the United States, notwithstanding that then President Trump had lost the Electoral College vote as well as the popular vote in the 2020 presidential election. Um, that declaration of Donald Trump as the next president would have plunged America into what I believe would have been tantamount to a revolution within a constitutional crisis in America, which in my view, and I'm only one man, would have been the first constitutional crisis since the founding of the Republic. Thank you very much, Judge, um, for your solemn attention to these issues and, and for your um, appearance here today. Um, we're going to describe and discuss in detail uh, what happened. Um, and, and as we do, I'm going to describe a few of the details now um, of some of the actions taken uh, by a gentleman named Kenneth Cheeseborough. Uh, after the uh, Electoral College met uh, and cast their votes on December 14th, um, actually the day before they met, Kenneth Cheeseborough sent a memo to Rudy Giuliani, the president's lead outside counsel. Mr. Cheeseborough wrote to Mayor Giuliani that the vice president is charged with, quote, making judgments about what to do if there are conflicting votes, close quote. Mr. Cheeseborough wrote that when the joint session of Congress got to Arizona in the alphabetical list of states, the vice president should not count the Biden votes, quote, because there are two slates of votes. His justification, which we will learn more about in our next hearing, was that a group of Trump supporters in Arizona and other swing states decided to proclaim themselves the true electors for the state, creating two sets of electors, the official electors selected by the state and a group of fake electors. This document was ordered to be produced to the select committee by a federal district court judge. As you will see on the screen shortly, Judge David Carter wrote, quote, the draft memo pushed a strategy that knowingly violated the Electoral Count Act. The judge concluded that, quote, the memo is both intimately related to and clearly advanced the plan to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. A few days later, Professor John Eastman took up this cause. Eastman was at the time a law professor at Chapman University Law School. He prepared a memo outlining the nonsensical theory that the vice president could decide the outcome of the election at the joint session of Congress on January 6th. You will see portions of this memo on the screen. In the first line, 
He wrote, quote, seven states have transmitted dual slates of electors to the President of the Senate. But Dr. Eastman goes on to rely on those so-called dual slates of electors to say that Vice President Pence could simply declare President Trump the winner of the 2020 election. Mr. Jacob, were there in fact dual slates of electors from seven states? No, there were not. And just a few days after that, Dr. Eastman wrote another memo. This one, quote, wargaming out several scenarios. He knew the outcome he wanted, and he saw a way to go forward if he simply pretended that fake electors were real. You will see that memo up on the screen now. Here, Dr. Eastman says the vice president can reject the Biden electors from the states that he calls, quote, disputed. Under several of the scenarios, the vice president could ultimately just declare Donald Trump the winner, regardless of the vote totals that had already been certified by the states. However, this was false, and Dr. Eastman knew it was false. In other words, it was a lie. In fact, on December 19th, 2020, just four days before Dr. Eastman sent this memo, Dr. Eastman himself admitted in an email that the fake electors had no legal weight, referring to the fake electors as, quote, dead on arrival in Congress, end quote, because they did not have a certification from their states. Judge Ludig, did the Trump electors in those seven states who were not certified by any state authority have any legal significance? Congresswoman, there, there was um, no support whatsoever in either the Constitution of the United States nor the laws of the United States uh, for the Vice President, frankly, ever to count alternative electoral slates from the states that had not been officially certified by the designated state official in the Electoral Count Act of 1887. I did notice in the passage from Mr. Eastman's memorandum, and I took a note on it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he said in that passage that there was both legal authority as well as historical precedent. I do know what Mr. Eastman was referring to when he said that there was historical precedent for doing so. He was incorrect. There was no historical precedent from the beginning of the founding in 1789 that even as mere historical precedent, as distinguished from legal precedent, would support the possibility of the Vice President of the United States quote, counting alternative electoral slates that had not been officially certified to the Congress pursuant to the Electoral Count Act of 1887. I would be glad to explain that historical precedent if the committee wanted, but it, it would be a digression. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, I know my colleagues will be pursuing that issue in more depth, uh, and now I'd like to yield back, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you very much. Pursuant to Section 5C8 of House Resolution 503, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar, and Staff Counsel, Mr. John Wood, for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're fortunate to have a bipartisan staff. Senior Investigative Counsel John Wood previously served as United States Attorney in Missouri under President George W. Bush. He and I will share today's lines of questioning. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. Uh, Judge Ludig, I had the incredible honor of serving as one of your law clerks. Another person who did uh, was John Eastman. And you have written that Dr. Eastman's theory that the vice president could determine who the next president of the United States is, is, in your words, incorrect at every turn. Could you please explain briefly your analysis? It was my honor, Mr. Wood, to have you serve as my law clerk. I, I could answer that question perfectly if I had uh, at my disposal either Mr. Eastman's tweet or my own <clears throat> analytical tweet of September 21st, but I don't. But um, that said, let me try to um, remember the analysis of, of Mr. Eastman's analysis. And, and Judge, I can read to you and to the audience, I think what was a really key passage from your very insightful analysis when you wrote, I believed that Professor Eastman was incorrect at every turn of the analysis in his January 2nd memorandum, beginning with his claim that there were legitimate competing slates of electors presented from seven states, and you've already addressed that issue. But your next sentence said, continuing to his conclusion that the vice president could unilaterally decide not to count the votes from the seven states from which competing slates were allegedly presented. So what was your basis for concluding that Dr. Eastman was incorrect in his conclusion that the vice president could unilaterally decide not to count the votes from these disputed states? I understand. Uh, as I previously uh, stated in response to Congresswoman Cheney, The, there was no basis in the Constitution or laws of the United States at all for the theory espoused by Mr. Eastman, at all, none. With all respect to my co-panelists, he said, I believe in partial response to one of the select committee's questions, that the single sentence in the 12th Amendment was, he thought, inartfully written. That single sentence is not inartfully written. It was pristine clear that the President of the Senate on January 6th, the incumbent Vice President of the United States, had little substantive constitutional authority if any, at all. The Twelfth Amendment, the single sentence that Mr. Jacob refers to, says in substance that 
following the transmission of the certificates to the Congress of the United States and under the Electoral Count Act of 1887, uh, the Archivist of the United States, that the presiding officer shall open the certificates in the presence of the Congress of the United States in joint session. It then says unmistakably not even that the vice president himself shall count the electoral votes. It clearly says merely that the electoral count votes shall then be counted. It was the Electoral Count Act of, of 1887 that, um, that, that filled in, if you will, uh, the simple words of, of, of the Twelfth Amendment in order to uh, construct for the country uh, a process for the counting of the, uh, the, the sacred process for the counting of the electoral votes from the states, that neither our original Constitution nor even the Twelfth Amendment had done. The irony, if you will, is that from its founding until 1887, in, when Congress passed the Electoral Count Act, um, the nation had been in considerable turmoil during at least five of its presidential elections, beginning as soon thereafter from the founding as 1800. So it wasn't for almost 100 years later until the Electoral Count Act was passed. So uh, that's why, in my view, that piece of legislation uh, is not only a work in progress for the country, but at this moment in history, uh, an important work in progress that needs to take place. That was long-winded, I understand. Well, Judge Ludig, at the risk of oversimplifying for the non-lawyers who are watching, is it fair to say that the 12th Amendment basically says two things happen. The vice president opens the, the certificates and the electoral votes are counted. Is it that straightforward? I would not want that to be my testimony before the Congress of the United States. The language of the Twelfth Amendment is that simple. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Jacob, I have a question for you. Uh, I believe during your deposition before this committee, you said something to the effect of you'd read every word written about the Twelfth Amendment, the Electoral Count Act, and historical practice. Uh, I know in response to the chairman's earlier question, you gave your bottom line conclusion, but can you tell us a little bit about the process that you and your colleagues went through of researching this issue and what conclusion you came to after your thorough research? So, <clears throat> you, you, as a lawyer who's analyzing a constitutional provision, you start 
with the constitutional text, you go to structure, you go to history. So we started with the text. Um, we did not think that the text was quite as unambiguous as Judge Ludig indicated. Um, in part, we had a constitutional crisis in 1876 because in that year, um, multiple slates of electors were certified by multiple slates. And when it came time to count those votes, the antecedent question of which ones had to be answered. That required the appointment of an independent commission. Um, that commission had had to resolve that question, and the purpose of the uh, Electoral Count Act of 1887 had been to resolve those latent ambiguities. Now, I'm in complete agreement with Judge Ludig. It is unambiguous that the vice president does not have the authority to reject electors. There is no suggestion of any kind that it does. There is no mention of rejecting or objecting to electors anywhere in the 12th Amendment. Um, and so the notion that the vice president could do that certainly is not in the text. But the problem uh, that we had and that John Eastman raised in our discussions was we had all seen that in Congress in 2000, in 2004, in 2016, there had been objections raised to various states. And those had even been debated in 2004. And so here you have an amendment that says nothing about objecting or rejecting, and yet we did have some recent practice of that happening within the terms of the Electoral Count Act. So we started with that text. And I, I recall in my discussion with the Vice President, he said, I can't wait to go to heaven and meet the framers and tell them the work that you did in putting together our Constitution is a work of genius. Thank you. It was divinely inspired. There is one sentence that I would like to talk to you a little bit about. <clears throat> so then we went to structure. And again, the Vice President's first instinct here is so decisive on this question. There is just no way that the framers of the Constitution who divided power and authority, who separated it out, who um, had broken away from George III uh, and declared him to be a tyrant. There was no way that they would have put in the hands of one person the authority to determine who was going to be President of the United States. And then we went to history. We examined every single electoral vote count that had happened in Congress since the beginning of the country. Um, we examined the Electoral Count Act. We examined practice under the Electoral Count Act. And critically, no vice president in 230 years of history had ever claimed to have that kind of authority, hadn't claimed authority to reject electoral votes, had not claimed authority to return electoral votes back to the states. In the entire history of the United States, not once had a joint session ever returned electoral votes back to the states to be counted. And in the uh, crisis of 1876, Justice Bradley uh, of the United States Supreme Court, who supplied the decisive final vote on that commission, had specifically looked at that question and said, first, the vice president clearly doesn't have authority to decide anything, and by the way, also does not have authority to conduct an investigation by sending things back out um, for a public look at things. So the history was absolutely decisive. And again, part of my discussion with Mr. Eastman was, if you were right, don't you think Al Gore might have liked to have known in 2000 that he had authority to just declare himself president of the United States? Did you think that the Democrat lawyers just didn't think of this very obvious quirk that he could use to do that? And of course, he acknowledged Al Gore did not and should not have had that authority at that point in time. But so text, structure, history, I think what we had was some ambiguous text that common sense and structure would tell you the answer cannot possibly be that the vice president has that authority. As the committee already played the vice president's remarks, there is almost no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person would choose the American president and then unbroken historical practice for 230 years that the vice president did not have such an authority. 
Thank you. I reserve the remainder of my time. Mr. Jacob, you weren't the only one who knew that the legal theory was wrong, though. Here is what various advisors to the president thought about that theory. You've been clear repeatedly with Mr. Meadows about you and the vice president having a different view about his authority on January 6th. I believe I had. Did Mr. Meadows ever explicitly or tacitly agree with you or say, yeah, that makes sense or okay? I believe that, um, that Mark did agree. What makes you say that? I believe that's what he told me, but as I mentioned, I think Mark had told so many people so many different things that it was not something that, uh, that I would necessarily accept as, okay, well, that means that's resolved. I see. Tell me more what, what he told you on this topic. Well, I think it was that, you know, the vice president doesn't have any broader role. Mm -hmm. And I think he was understanding of that. So despite the fact that he may have said other things to the president or others, to you, he said he understands the vice yes. president has no role. Yes. Okay. Did he say that to you several times? A couple of times. Mm -hmm. Before January 6th? Yes. The way it was communicated to me was that um, uh, Pastor Baloney thought the idea was, uh, was nutty and had uh, at one point uh, confronted Eastman uh, basically with the same sentiment. Pat expressed the, his admiration for the vice president's actions on the day of the 6th and said that he concurred with the uh, legal analysis that, that our team had, had put together to reach um, that point. It made no sense to me that in all the protections that were built into the Constitution for a president to get elected and steps that had to be taken, that the power to choose the next president would be sitting at, with the vice president. Do you know if Mr. Clark or Mr. Um, Morgan, is it Morgan? Viewed about that, thought about that, Mr. Eastman's advice? Yeah, they thought he was crazy. Do you know if they ever expressed an opinion on whether they thought the vice president had the power that John Eastman said he did? Uh, I know for a fact I heard both say that his theory was crazy, that there was no uh, validity to it in any way, shape, or form. And did they express that before January 6th? Yes. To whom? I think anyone who would listen. Okay. Uh, what were your prior interactions with Eastman? He described for me what he thought the ambiguity was in the statute, and he was walking through it at that time. And I said, to him, hold on a second. I want to understand what you're saying. You're saying that you believe the vice president acting as president of the Senate can be the sole decision maker as to, under your theory, who becomes the next president of the United States? And... He said, yes. And I said, are you out of your effing mind? Right? And I, oh, that was pretty blunt. I said, you're completely crazy. I said, you're going to turn around and tell 78 plus million people in this country that your theory is this is how you're going to invalidate their votes because you think election was stolen. And I said, they're not going to tolerate that. He said, you're going to cause riots in the streets. And he said, words to the effect of there's been violence in the history of our country, Eric, to protect the democracy or protect the republic. In fact, there was a risk that the lawyers in the White House Counsel's Office would resign. For example, Fox News host Sean Hannity expressed concern that the entire White House Counsel's Office could quit. As you can see from these texts, Mr. Hannity wrote to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows that, quote, we can't lose the entire White House Counsel's Office. I do not see January 6th happening the way he is being told. A few days later, on January 5th, Mr. Hannity wrote to Mr. Meadows that, quote, I'm very worried the next 48 hours. Pence pressure, White House counsel will leave. While Sean Hannity was apparently very concerned about the possibility that the White House counsel would resign in protest of the president's effort to force the vice president to violate the Constitution, some others close to the president were more dismissive of the White House counsel's position. 
Here's what Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner said during his deposition regarding the White House counsel Pat Cipollone's threats to resign. Jared, uh, are you aware of um, instances where uh, Pat Cipollone threatened to resign? I, I kind of, uh, like I said, my interest at that time was on trying to get as many pardons done. Uh, and I know that, you know, he was always, to him and the team were always saying, oh, we're going to resign. We're not going to be here if this happens, if that happens. So I kind of took it up to just be whining, to be honest with you. The president's own lead outside counsel, Rudy Giuliani, also seemed to concede that the vice president did not have the authority to decide the outcome of the election or send it back to the states. Here's what White House attorney Eric Hirschman said about his call with Mayor Giuliani on the morning of the 6th. On the morning of January 6th, I think he called me out of the blue, right? And I was like getting dressed. And we had an intellectual discussion about Eastman's, uh, East, I don't know if it's Eastman's theory per se, but the VP's role. And you know, he was asking me my view and analysis and then the practical implications of it. And when we finished, he said, like, I believe that, you know, you're probably right. I think he thought when we're done that it would be something he'd have to consider if he was sitting on the bench. But he'd probably come down in that, you know, you couldn't interpret it or uh, sustain the argument long term. But Mayor Giuliani seemed to admit that the theory was wrong, did not stop him from going before the crowd just a few hours later on January 6th and saying the exact opposite. Here's Mayor Giuliani's speech at the Ellipse rally on January 6th. We're here uh, just very briefly to make a very important two points. Number one, every single thing that has been outlined as the plan for today is perfectly legal. I have Professor Eastman here with me to say a few words about that. He's one of the preeminent constitutional scholars in the United States. As we come up at the top of the hour, we're going to have to end our coverage of this January 6th hearing on the NBC network. My colleagues and I will continue our coverage on the hearings on our streaming platform, NBC News Now. For everyone else, U.S. Open golf begins momentarily. I'm Lester Holt for NBC News in New York. Good day. He can decide, he can decide on the validity of these crooked ballots. And we now resume our coverage on NBC News Now of the January 6th hearing. Give them five to ten days to finally finish the work. And here's what Dr. Eastman said in his speech at the Ellipse on January 6th. demanding of Vice President Pence is this afternoon at 1 o'clock, he let the legislatures of the state look into this so we get to the bottom of it and the American people know whether we have control of the direction of our government or not. Even Dr. Eastman knew his theory didn't hold water. Mr. Jacob, you discussed and even debated this theory at length with Dr. Eastman. Did Dr. Eastman ever tell you what he thought the U.S. Supreme Court would do if it had to decide this issue? Yes. <clears throat> um, we had an extended discussion, an hour and a half to two hours, on January 5th. Um, and when I pressed him uh, on the point, I said, John, if the vice president did what you were asking him to do, we would lose nine to nothing in the Supreme Court, wouldn't we? Um, and he initially started, well, I think maybe you would lose only seven to two, um, and after some further discussion acknowledged, well, yeah, you're right, we would lose nine nothing. I appreciate that. In our investigation, the select committee has obtained evidence suggesting that Dr. Eastman never really believed his own theory. Let me explain. On the screen, you can see a draft letter to the president from October 2020. In this letter, an idea was proposed that the vice president could determine which electors to count at the joint session of Congress. But the person writing in blue 
eviscerates that argument. The person who wrote the comments in blue wrote, quote, the 12th Amendment only says that the President of the Senate opens the ballots in the joint session and then, in the passive voice, that the votes shall then be counted. The comments in blue further state, nowhere does it suggest that the President of the Senate gets to make the determination on his own. Judge Ludig, does it surprise you that the author of those comments in blue was in fact John Eastman? Yes, it does, Congressman. Uh, but let me, watching this unfold, let me try to unpack what was at the root of what I have called the blueprint to overturn the 2020 election. And it is this, and I had foreshadowed this answer in my earlier testimony to Congresswoman Cheney. Mr. Eastman, from the beginning, said to the President that there was both legal as well as historical precedent for the Vice President to overturn the election. And what we've heard today, I believe, is, is what happened within the White House and elsewhere as all the, the players led by uh, Mr. Eastman got wrapped around the axle. by the historical evidence claim by Mr. Eastman. Let me explain very simply. This is what I said would require a digression that I would be glad to undertake if you wished. In short, if I had been advising the Vice President of the United States on January 6th, and even if then Vice President Jefferson and even then Vice President John Adams and even then Vice President Richard Nixon had done exactly what the President of the United States wanted his Vice President to do. I would have laid my body across the road before I would have let the Vice President overturn the 2020 election on the basis of that historical precedent. But what this body needs to know, and now America needs to know, is that that was the centerpiece of the plan to overturn the 2020 election. It was the historical precedent in the years and with the vice presidents that I, I named, as Congressman Raskin understands well. And the, the effort by Mr. Eastman and others was to, to drive that historical precedent up to and under that single sentence 
single pristine sentence in the Twelfth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Taking advantage of, if you will, what many have said is the inartful wording of that sentence in the Twelfth Amendment. Scholars before 2020 would have used that historical precedent to argue not that Vice President Pence could overturn the 2020 election by accepting non-certified state electoral votes, but they would have made arguments as to some substantive not merely procedural authority possessed by the Vice President of the United States on, on the, the statutorily prescribed day for counting the Electoral College votes. This is, um, this is constitutional mischief. Judge, I think, that's a, I think that's a good point. And I think it kind of begs the question that if the vice president had this power to determine the outcome of a presidential election, why hasn't it ever been used before? Why hasn't that ever happened? Why hasn't a vice president simply rejected the outcome of an election and declared someone else the winner? And instead, as the chairman mentioned in his opening, for over two centuries, vice presidents have presided over the joint sessions of Congress in a purely ceremonial role. This even includes, as Mr. Jacob mentioned, Vice President Al Gore. For those of us who are old enough to remember, the 2000 election came down to one state, Florida. There were weeks of recounts and litigation after the election, and Al Gore conceded. Of course, Al Gore was vice president at the time. But he never suggested that he could simply declare himself the winner of the 2000 election when he presided over the counting of the electoral votes. Let's hear what Vice President Gore said when he described the situation he faced in 2000. The importance of the United States of America in all of human history. Uh, in Lincoln's phrase, we still are the last best hope of humankind. Uh, and the choice between one's own uh, disappointment uh, in your personal career and upholding the the noble traditions of America's uh, democracy is a pretty easy choice when it comes down to it. Mr. Jacob, did Dr. Eastman say whether he would want other vice presidents such as Al Gore after the 2000 election or Kamala Harris after the 2024 election to have the power to decide the outcome of the, of the election? So this was one of the many points that we discussed on January 5th. Um, he had come into that meeting trying to persuade us that there was some validity to his theory. I viewed it as my objective to persuade him to acknowledge he was just wrong. And I thought this had to be one of the most powerful arguments. I mean, John, back in 2000, you weren't jumping up and saying Al Gore had this authority to do that. You would not want Kamala Harris to be able to exercise that kind of authority in 2024 when I hope Republicans will win the election, and I know you hope that too, John. And he said, absolutely. Al Gore did not have a basis to do it in 2000. Kamala Harris shouldn't be able to do it in 2024, but I think you should do it today. Mark Short told the Select Committee that Vice President Pence consulted with one of his predecessors, Vice President Dan Quayle, regarding the role of the Vice President. Vice President Quayle confirmed Pence's view that the role was purely ceremonial. Mr. Short also told the committee that he, Mr. Short, received a call from former House Speaker Paul Ryan. Here is Mr. Short's description of his conversation with Speaker Ryan. Speaker Ryan wanted to call and say, you know, you don't have any greater authority. And I, I said to him, Mr. Speaker, you, you know Mike, you know he doesn't, you know he recognizes that. And we sort of laughed about it, and he said, I get it. And he later spoke to, um, to the vice president, too, to, I think, have the same conversation. 
Fortunately for the fate of our republic, Vice President Pence refused to go along with President Trump's demands that he determine the outcome of the presidential election. Mr. Jacob, what was the Vice President's reaction when you discussed with him the theory that the Vice President could decide the outcome of the election? Congressman, as I've testified, the Vice President's first instinct uh, was that there was no way that any one person, uh, particularly the Vice President who is on the ticket and has a vested outcome in the election, could possibly have the authority to um, decide it by rejecting electors or to decisively alter the outcome by um, suspending the joint session for the first time in history in order to try to get a different outcome from state legislatures. Despite the fact that the vice president had a strongly held and correct view that he could not decide the outcome of the election, President Trump launched a multi-week campaign of both public Here are some examples of the intense pressure the vice president faced from all sides and what his chief of staff thought of it. And I hope Mike Pence comes through for us, I have to tell you. I hope that our great vice president our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. Was it your impression that the vice president had directly conveyed his position on these issues to the president, not just to the world through a dear colleague letter, but directly to President Trump? Many times. And had been consistent in conveying his position to the president? Very consistent. I am, I am aware of the fact that the president was upset with the way uh, Pence acted. Are, right. are we to assume that this is going to be a climactic battle? Well, I think a lot of that depends on the courage and the spine of the individuals involved. That would be a nice way to say a guy named Mike, uh, Vice President Mike Pence? Yes. I think we've been clear as to what the vice president's role was. I think the vice president made clear with the president. I think I've been clear with Mark Meadows. I think the vice president is going to throw down tomorrow and do the right thing because, Lou, like I said before, this is a time for choosing. People are going to look back at this moment tomorrow and remember where every single one of their elected officials were. Did they vote for the rule of law and getting these elections right, or did they give it away to the Democrats and the people who cheated and stole their way through this election? Definitely, in the you know, when I got back into town, as talk, say, like the, the fifth and the sixth. Uh, the president was, you know, all the attention was on uh, what Mike would do or what Mike wouldn't do. The vice president really was not wavering in his commitment to what he, what his responsibility was. And so, yeah, was it, was it painful? Sure. The president's pressure campaign started in December. For example, although the vice president made his views clearly and unmistakably known to the president and others in the White House, on December 23rd, President Trump retweeted a memo from an individual named Ivan Reichlin entitled Operation Pence Card that called on the vice president to refuse the electoral college votes from certain states that had certified Joe Biden as the winner. President Trump started his pressure campaign in December but he dialed up the pressure as January 6th approached. The testimony we have received in our investigation indicates that by the time January 4th arrived, President Trump had already engaged in a, quote, multi-week campaign to pressure the vice president to decide the outcome of the election. This had included private conversations between the two leaders, Trump's tweets, and at least one meeting with members of Congress. We understand that the vice president started his day on January 4th with a rally in Georgia for the Republican candidates in the U.S. Senate runoff. When the vice president returned to Washington, he was summoned to meet with the president regarding the upcoming joint session of Congress. Mr. Jacob, who attended that meeting? The attendees were the vice president, the president, um, Mark Short, the chief of staff to the vice president, myself, and John Eastman. Uh, there was about a five-minute period where Mark Meadows came in on a different issue. Let's show a photo of that meeting. Mr. Jacob, during that meeting between the president and the vice president, what theories did Dr. Eastman present regarding the role of the vice president in counting the electoral votes? During the meeting on January 4th, um, 
Mr. Eastman was opining that there were two legally viable arguments um, as to authorities that the vice president could exercise two days later on January 6th. Um, one of them was that he could um, reject electoral votes outright. Uh, the other was that he could use his capacity as presiding officer to suspend the proceedings um, and declare essentially a 10-day recess um, during which uh, states uh, that he deemed to be disputed, there was a list of five to seven states that um, the exact number changed from conversation to conversation, but that the vice president could um, sort of issue a demand to the state legislatures in those states to re-examine the election and declare who had won each of those states. So he said that both of those were legally viable options. Um, he said that he did not recommend, um, upon questioning, he did not recommend what he called the more aggressive option, which was reject outright, because he thought that that would be less politically palatable, um, that the imprimatur of state legislature authority um, would be necessary to ultimately um, have uh, public acceptance of an outcome in favor of President Trump, and so he advocated that the preferred course of action would be the procedural route of suspending the joint session and sending the election back to the states. Mr. Jacob, I know you won't discuss the direct conversations between the president and the vice president, so rather than asking you what the vice president said in that meeting, I'll ask you a more general question. Did the vice president ever waver in his position that he could not unilaterally decide which electors to accept? The vice president never budged from the position that I have described as his first instinct, which was that it just made no sense from everything that he knew and had studied about our Constitution that one person would have that kind of authority. And did the vice president ever waver in his position that he could not delay certification and send it back to the states? No, he did not. Did Dr. Eastman admit in front of the president that his proposal would violate the Electoral Count Act? So during that meeting on the 4th, um, I think I raised uh, the problem that both of Mr. Eastman's proposals would violate several provisions of the Electoral Count Act. Um, Mr. Eastman acknowledged that that was the case, um, that even what he viewed as the more politically palatable option would violate several provisions, but he thought that we could do so because in his view the Electoral Count Act was unconstitutional. And when I raised concerns that that position would likely lose in court, his view was that the court simply wouldn't get involved. They would invoke the political question doctrine, um, and therefore we could have some comfort proceeding uh, with that path. Mr. Wood? But just to re reiterate, he told you, maybe this was in a later conversation, but he told you at some point that if, in fact, the issue ever got to the Supreme Court, his theory would lose 9-0, correct? The next morning, um, starting around 11 or 11.30, we met for an hour and a half to two hours. And in that meeting, um, I've already described the text, structure, history conversation, but we started walking through all of that. And I said, you know, so John, basically what you have is some text that may be a little bit ambiguous, but then nothing else that would support it including the fact that nobody would ever want that to be the rule, wouldn't we lose nine to nothing in the Supreme Court? And again, he initially started, well, maybe you'd only lose seven to two, but ultimately acknowledged that no, we would lose nine zero. No judge would support his argument. After his meeting with the Vice President, Donald Trump flew to Georgia for a rally in support of the Republican candidates in the United States Senate runoff. Even though the vice president was, had been steadfast in resisting the president's pressure, President Trump continued to publicly pressure Vice President Pence in his Georgia speech. Rather than focusing exclusively on the Georgia Senate runoff, Trump turned his attention to Mike Pence. Here's what the president said during that rally in Georgia. Pence comes through for us, I have to tell you. 
and our great vice president, our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. So the president had been told multiple times that the vice president could not affect the outcome of the election, but he nonetheless publicly pressured Mike Pence to do exactly that by saying, quote, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him as much. Let's turn now to January 5th. Mr. Wood. Thank you. That morning, meaning January 5th, the president issued a tweet expressly stating that the vice president had the power to reject electors. Let's look at what the president wrote. Quote, the vice president has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors. Mr. Jacob, you've already told us about your meeting with Dr. Eastman and the president on January 4th, and you briefly made reference to the meeting you had with Dr. Eastman the next day, January 5th. Can you tell us a little bit more about that meeting with Dr. Eastman on January 5th? For example, where was the meeting? Who was there? So at the conclusion of the meeting on the 4th, the president had asked that, um, that our office meet with uh, Mr. Eastman the next day to hear more about the positions he had expressed at that meeting. And the vice president indicated that um, sort of offered me up as his counsel uh, to fulfill that duty. So. Uh, we met in Mark Short's office in the executive office building um, across the way from the White House. Um, Dr. Eastman had a, a court hearing by Zoom that morning, so it didn't start first thing, but rather started around 11. Um, and that meeting went for about an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, Chief of Staff Mark Short was uh, at that meeting most of the time. There were a few times that he uh, left. And essentially, it was an, an extended discussion. Um, what most surprised me about that meeting was that when Mr. Eastman came in, um, he said, I'm here to request that you reject the electors. So on the 4th, that had been the path that he had said, I'm not recommending that you do that. But on the 5th, he came in and um, expressly requested that. And I grabbed a notebook as I was heading into the meeting. Um, I didn't hear much new from him to record, but that was the first thing I recorded uh, in my notes was request that the VP reject. Just to be clear, you're saying that Dr. Eastman urged the vice president to adopt the very same approach that Dr. Eastman appeared to abandon in the Oval Office meeting with the president the day before. Is that correct? He had recommended against it the evening before, and then on the 5th came in, and I think it was probably his first words after introductions and as we sat down were, I'm here to request that you reject the electors in the disputed states. And you referenced a moment ago some handwritten notes, which you've provided to the select committee. I'd now like to show you those notes. Uh, as you can see, you wrote there at the top, the writing's a little bit faint in the copy, but you wrote, requesting VP reject. Does that accurately reflect what Dr. Eastman asked of you in your meeting on January 5th? Yes. And what was your reaction when Dr. Eastman said on January 5th that he was there to ask the Vice President of the United States to reject electors at the joint session of Congress? I was surprised because I had viewed it as sort of one of the key concessions that we had secured the night before from Mr. Eastman that, um, that he was not recommending that we do that. So what did you say to him? Well, as I indicated, to some extent, it simplified my task because the, um, there are more procedural complexities to the send it back to the state's point of view. And I actually had spent most of my evening the night before writing a memorandum to the vice president explaining um, all of the specific provisions of the Electoral Count Act that that plan would violate. Um, so instead, since he was uh, pushing the sort of robust unilateral power theory, 
I've already walked the committee through the discussions that we had. We, again, we, I started out with our points of commonality, uh, or what I thought were our points of commonality. We're conservatives, we're small government people, we believe in originalism as the means that, by which we're gonna interpret this. And so we walked through the text, we walked through the history, and I, the committee has shown footage of Mr. Eastman on the stage on the 6th claiming that Jefferson supported his position in a historical example of Jefferson. In fact, he conceded in that meeting Jefferson did not at all support his position, that in the election of 1800, there had been some small technical defect with the certificate in Georgia. It was absolutely undisputed that Jefferson had won Georgia. Jefferson did not assert that he had any authority to reject electors. He did not assert that he had any authority to resolve any issue um, during the course of that. And so he acknowledged by the end uh, that there was no historical practice whatsoever that supported his position. He had initially tried to, to push examples of Jefferson and Adams. He ultimately acknowledged they did not work, as we've covered. He acknowledged it would lose 9-0 in the Supreme Court. He again tried to say, but I don't think the courts will get involved in this. Um, they'll invoke the political question doctrine, and so if the courts stay out of it, that will mean that we'll have the 10 days for the states to weigh in and resolve it. Um, and then the, uh, you know, they'll, they'll send back the Trump slates of electors and the people will be able to accept that. And I expressed my vociferous disagreement with that point. I did not think that this was a political question. Um, among other things, if the courts did not step in to resolve this, there was nobody else to resolve it you would be in a situation where you have a standoff between the President of the United States and counterfactually the Vice President of the United States saying that we've exercised authorities that constitutionally we think we have by which we have deemed ourselves the winners of the election. You would have an opposed House and Senate disagreeing with that. You would have state legislatures that to that point, I mean, Republican leaders across those legislatures had put together, had put out statements, and we collected these for the vice president as well, that the people had spoken in their states and that they had no intention of reversing the outcome of the election. We did receive some signed letters that um, Mr. Eastman forwarded us by minorities of leaders in those states, but no state had any legislative house that indicated that it had any interest in it. So you would have had just a, an unprecedented uh, constitutional jump ball situation with that standoff. And as I expressed to him, that issue might well then have to be decided in the streets. Because if we can't work it out politically, we've already seen how charged up people are about this election. And so it would be a, a disastrous situation to be in. So I said, I think the courts will intervene. I do not see a commitment in the Constitution of the question whether the vice president has that authority to some other actor to resolve. There, there's arguments about whether Congress and the vice president jointly um, have a constitutional commitment to generally decide electoral vote issues. I, I don't think that they have any authority to object or reject them. I don't see it in the 12th Amendment, but nonetheless. Um, and I concluded by saying, John, in light of everything that we've discussed, can't you, we just both agree that this is a terrible idea? Um, and he couldn't quite bring himself to say yes to that, but he very clearly said, well, yeah, I see we're not going to be able to persuade you to do this. And that was how the meeting concluded. But you just described a terrifying scenario. Sounds like there could have been chaos under the Eastman approach. And you even described it as it potentially could be decided in the streets. And you described several concessions that Dr. Eastman made throughout that discussion or even debate that you had with him. At some point during that meeting on January 5th, 
Did Dr. Eastman seem to admit that both of the theories that he had presented to the United States the day before? So the theory that the vice president could reject electors outright and declare Donald Trump the winner, and his less aggressive theory that uh, the vice president could simply send it back to the states. At some point in that conversation on the 5th, did Dr. Eastman seem to admit that both of these theories suffered from similar legal flaws? So I had at least one, possibly two other conversations with Dr. Eastman later that day. In the earlier meeting, we really were focused because his request that he made had been reject the electors outright on why that theory was wrong and why we certainly would not be doing that. Later that day, uh, he pivoted back to, well, we hear you loud and clear, you're not going to reject. Um, but remember last night, I said that there was this more prudent course where you could just send it back to the states. Would you be willing to do that? And during the course of our discussion about um, his renewed request that we consider that option, he acknowledged to me, he put it, um, both Mr. Eastman and myself are graduates of the University of Chicago Law School, and he said, look, as graduates of that august institution, you and I will mutually understand that the underlying legal theory of plenary vice presidential authority is what you have to have to get there. Because this new theory, as I was pointing out to him, uh, or the procedural theory, still violates several provisions of the Electoral Count Act, as he acknowledged. And the only way that you could ever be able to ignore several provisions of statutory law is if it was pretty clear that they were unconstitutional. And the only way they could be unconstitutional is if the vice president had the plenary authorities that were formed the basis for the reject the votes as well. So he acknowledged in those conversations that the underlying legal theory was the same. He just thought that the send it back to the states option would be more politically palatable, and he hoped more palatable to the vice president for that reason. And in fact, when Dr. Eastman made this concession during that meeting, according to your earlier deposition, Dr. Eastman said, just between us, University of Chicago chickens. Is that right? I don't think that the University of Chicago is going to start a Chicago Chickens fundraising club. <laughs> but yes, that is the terminology that he used. He said, you know, just between us Chicago Chickens, we will understand um, as, as lawyers who have studied the Constitution that the underlying basis really is the same. I reserve the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Jacob, the President and the Vice President meet again on that same topic the next day. January 5th, correct? There, so after my extended meeting uh, with Mr. Eastman that morning, um, during that time, the vice president had been back at his residence working on his statement to the nation that we released the next day. Um, he got down to the White House um, some point between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock as uh, my meeting uh, with Mr. Eastman was wrapping up. And when we, uh, Mark Short and I, went over to meet with the vice president, and um, actually we thought maybe we had good news. We felt like we had sort of defeated uh, Mr. Eastman, that he was sort of acknowledging that there was no there there. But the vice president was then um, asked down to the Oval Office, and he went down to the Oval Office um, while Mark and I stayed back in the Vice President's office. You weren't in that meeting? I was not. In the book Peril, journalist Bob Woodward and Robert Costa write that the President said, quote, if these people say you have the power, wouldn't you want to? The Vice President says, quote, I wouldn't want any one person to have that authority. The President responds, but wouldn't it almost be cool to have that power? Vice President is reported to have said, no, look, I've read this, and I don't see a way to do it. We've exhausted every option. I've done everything I could, and then some, to find a way around this. It's simply not possible. My interpretation is no. To which the President says, no, no, no. 
You don't understand, Mike. You can do this. I don't want to be your friend anymore if you don't do this. We asked Mark Short about this during his deposition. The understanding that I would have um, in other conversations with the vice president, he articulated to me that no, he wouldn't want that power bestowed upon any one person. Mr. Jacob, did you, Mr. Short, and the Vice President have a call later that day again with the President and Dr. Eastman? So, yes, we did. And what did Dr. Eastman request on that call? Uh, on that phone call, which I believe was around 5 o'clock that afternoon, um, uh, Mr. Eastman stated that he had heard us loud and clear that morning. We were not going to be rejecting electors. But would we be open to considering the other course that we had discussed on the 4th, which would be to suspend the joint session and request that state legislatures re-examine uh, certification of the electoral votes? That same day, January 5th, the New York Times ran a story about the disagreement between the president and the vice president about whether the vice president could determine the outcome of the election. Even though the New York Times story was indisputably correct, Donald Trump denied it. Trump issued a statement claiming that the vice president had agreed that he could determine the outcome of the election, despite the fact that the vice president had consistently rejected that position. Let's look at what the president said in his statement. Quote, the New York Times report regarding comments Vice President Pence supposedly made to me today is fake news. He never said that. The Vice President and I are in total agreement that the Vice President has the power to act. Mr. Jacob, how did the Vice President's team react to the statement from the President that the Vice President could take an active role in determining the winner of the presidential election? Um, so, uh, we were shocked and disappointed uh, because whoever had written and put that statement out, it was categorically untrue. Vice President's Chief of Staff Mark Short had an angry phone call with Trump campaign senior advisor Jason Miller about this statement. Here's what Mr. Short and Mr. Miller told the committee about that call. Okay. Tell me about the conversation you had with Jason. It was brief. I was um, irritated and expressed uh, displeasure that a uh, statement that could have gone out that misrepresented the vice president's viewpoint without consultation. The statement says the vice president and I are in total agreement that the vice president has the power to act. Is that incorrect? I think the record shows that that's incorrect. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've been through many documents that clarify that this is not where the vice president was. Right. So essentially, the president is sending out a baldly false statement about being in alignment, purported alignment with the vice president, despite all of the predicate that you indicated had gone before about their respective positions. Is that effectively what happened? I interpret the statement as false. I'll let you figure out who sent it out. When Mark Short contacted you, he, he was upset. Is that what you said? He clearly was not pleased. Tell us what he said. What's the process for putting out a statement for a meeting where only two people were in the room? Did he ask you to retract the statement? No, he just, I think it went right to what's the process for putting out a statement for a meeting when only two people were in the room. And he clearly disagreed with the substance though, right? Because he said that he said the vice president doesn't agree with this. I'm trying to think what exactly he said. I mean, the, the tone uh, was very clearly that, uh, uh, he, he, he used some language to uh, strongly infer that the vice president disagreed with, with that take, but I don't remember what that language was. Did he dictate this statement? We, uh, he dictated, uh, he dictated most of it. I mean, typically on these, um, typically on these, I might have a couple of wording suggestions 
uh, or um, maybe I you know, have a, a sense or a rough framework or something of that. Uh, but I, I know with uh, specificity on this one that it was me and him on the phone uh, talking through it. Um, and ultimately the way this came out um, was the way that he wanted to. The dispute between the president and the vice president had grown to the point where the vice president's chief of staff, Mark Short, was concerned that the president could, in Mr. Short's words, quote, lash out at the vice president on January 6th. In fact, Mr. Short was so concerned about it that he talked with the head of the vice president's secret service detail on January 5th. Here is Mr. Short. Concern was for the vice president's security, and so I wanted to make sure the head of the vice president's secret service was aware that um, that likely, as these disagreements became more public, that the president would um, lash out in some way. After the recess, we will hear that Mark Short's concerns were justified. The vice president was in danger. Mr. Chairman, I reserve. Pursuant to the order of the committee of today, the chair declares the committee in recess for a period of approximately 10 minutes. All right, a lot to unpack here, so let me walk you through uh, where we stand as the uh, committee takes that 10-minute break. So far, the focus has been on President Trump's pressure campaign against his vice president to not, uh, to not count the electoral votes on January 6th in an attempt to overturn the election. A lot of the testimony centering on a theory put forward by a lawyer named John Eastman. You keep hearing that name over and over again. He was working for President Trump. He claimed that the vice president had the power to send the election electoral college votes back to the states. The committee put forward a barrage of evidence by legal experts showing the vice president had no such power. They also provided evidence that Eastman himself acknowledged multiple times that it probably wasn't legal to do so. But President Trump, they say, pushed for it anyway. They presented videos that detailed that public pressure President Trump laid on to Pence in the lead up to the six and how that fueled the anger of the rioters, possibly putting the VP's life at risk. And that's the link they seem to be uh, moving towards as they entered the break. Advisors to Mike Pence testified to how the vice president refused to agree to the president's plan. One detailing how uh, when Pence was ready to announce he would not follow along with the plan, he told staff, this may be the most important thing I ever say. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker is with me, along with NBC Political Director and Moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Uh, some of the testimony there, very low-key, but there were some moments that would give you chills. Uh, Kristen, give me your first thoughts of what we've seen. My first thought is that this part of the hearing connected the dots and made the argument that John Eastman himself was aware that what he was proposing was not constitutional. He acknowledged it in in front of Greg Jacob over and over again, who is, of course, the counsel to Vice President Mike Pence. He even acknowledged it in front of former President Trump. And when Greg Jacob pressed him on whether this would withstand a Supreme Court challenge, he ultimately agreed that likely the justices would rule unanimously against doing such a thing. And he said that he didn't think that Al Gore would have had the authority to do such a thing in 2000. So I think that is one of the key takeaways here, really trying to connect those dots, that not just was this unconstitutional, but that John Eastman was aware of it and that he acknowledged that in front of the president. I think one of the statements that we heard from Mark Short was very critical. He said that uh, Mark Meadows, the chief of staff at the time, was saying different things to different people, but that he ultimately acknowledged he didn't think that President Trump and that former Vice President Mike Pence would have the authority to choose the elector. So I think it's that acknowledgement and that awareness Awareness that is the key takeaway at this point, that the people who were advising the president knew they were trying to break the law. And, and Chuck, something that you had talked about before the hearing began, this was going to lay out a series of mm -hmm. days, a series of events, create a, a, a trail that could easily be followed. It, it can. Look, I keep coming back. I wrote down this question, I think, at the start of this hearing. Have you committed a crime when you've asked someone else to commit a crime? Mm. Because what I, one of the things that has been laid out, I think, very well here, and that's what was emphatic here, is that the president, uh, Donald Trump was told multiple times, 
that this was not constitutional. His advisors were told multiple times this was not constitutional. John Eastman acknowledged at times it was not con uh, that it was not constitutional. And yet they kept pushing it. And yet the president kept claiming. So at this point, you know, if you're this isn't hard to conclude that the president knowingly tried to violate the law. So, again, when you look at these hearings, where are these hearings going? Are they going to end up leading to uh, some sort of charge against the former president? Mm -hmm. This is among the ways they're trying to essentially lay the breadcrumbs here for the Justice Department. The president knew everything he was doing, saying, and pushing in public. He knew everybody around him told him this was not legal. Mm -hmm. And yet he pushed it anyway. It's up to the Justice Department whether that has whether a crime's been committed, which is why I keep have you committed a crime when you've simply asked someone else to violate the law. Now they didn't violate the law. Mike Pence didn't do it, but Donald Trump wanted him in to. In terms of trying to impress upon, you know, public that may not be totally tuned into this, uh, I think they made as I noted, several chilling remarks. It was uh, Greg Jacob, the former counsel, uh, who says we might have had to work it out in the streets, talking about that the scenario that they were beginning to look at, this thing would head to the courts, and then the courts wouldn't take it. Right. Well, Eastman was hoping for that. And what he's right. essentially saying is you didn't have that intervention. Right. Who else is going to solve After this? After the courts. After the courts, we see what happens in other weaker and I, I, I hope right. they're weaker democracies than ours. And I think one of the points that the committee is trying to make is that we know what happened on January 6th, but on January 4th, on January 5th, mm -hmm. it was not a foregone conclusion. And they are really trying to highlight just how intense this pressure campaign was on the former vice president. And Judge Ludig described it, if it had happened, if former vice president Mike Pence had gone along with all of these suggestions as a revolution within a constitutional crisis. And you talk about fighting in the streets. They're trying to showcase the fact that, look, this could have gone another way. And the country's democracy was at stake. And there was talk about the tweet the president sent that seemed to suggest that, that Mike Pence was on board. And, and we heard the testimony that Mike Pence was livid. Was not on board. And you heard Mark Short there right. saying and acknowledging that he called up Jason Miller to say, okay. who put this out? Now, now, absorb all this. Absorb all this on January 4th, January 5th. But what is the president communicating to his supporters? What does he communicate? And we know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to step on what's coming, but we, had, we, we know what happened on January 6th. We've seen that laid out. And now you realize, wait a minute, while some people may have acted spontaneously in what they did at the Capitol, they were put in that position by a lie. Right. And, 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 by, and, and they were sort of motivated to go and do this because Donald Trump said Mike Pence let them down. Right. And then, of course, we saw that chilling video where you saw these insurrectionists basically ready to seek personal revenge. Let me bring Pence. it, if I can, right now. Senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake, he's outside the hearing room. Garrett, what are your takes uh, of this first half of the session? Well, just to build on Chuck's point, I mean, while these debates were going on behind the scene at the White House, and while you have folks like Greg Jacob thinking they've argued Eastman down from his position, the president was still inviting uh, the people who became the insurrectionists to Washington, D.C. He was actively encouraging people to come here and be part of something that, you know, while there was this academic debate going on inside the White House about how to move forward or not with this plan, the president was very much moving forward with bringing people people to Washington regardless. And Chuck also set up a little bit here, and we saw the committee kind of set the stage for this dramatic split that's about to happen between the president and the vice president. It kind of starts to spill out into the public in the debate over that statement, whether or not Pence agreed uh, with Trump on the path forward. And it really comes to a head uh, the next morning, where you start to have much more of these public statements after this private phone call that we're going to see discussed. Mike Pence then comes out with his statement first, saying, Saying, we're not going to you know, go forward with this. I'm going to do my constitutional duty. And then there's the tweet uh, that Donald Trump sends in the 2 p.m. hour of the 6th that the committee really believes is the culmination of this plot and the moment that Trump directs the mob in Pence's direction. So you have, again, just I think these two diverging sets of conversations, one almost academic about whether or not this uh, plot is constitutionally feasible, and the other happening right in 
in front of everyone's faces with Donald Trump inviting folks to Washington and then ultimately turning them at his vice president with this tweet on the 6th. All right, Garrett, thanks very much. Uh, Kristen, you got some news there. Yeah, uh, former President Trump is posting on Truth Social saying, I demand equal time, not surprisingly going on to attack the hearings broadly. And what's worth uh, noting about that, look, the committee has asked all of his former officials to come and talk to them, and they have refused. And now some of them are facing indictment because of that. So uh, the president may be demanding equal time, but at the same time, he and his former officials, a number of them have not gone along oh, with wait these a proceedings. They've been offered equal time here Absolutely. in so many different ways. You could go through it, whether it was Mitch McConnell could have had a, a bipartisan, totally equal, balanced committee if people were looking for that. Mitch McConnell shut that down along, yeah. you know, with Trump allies on that front. But again, they've been plenty of opportunities to participate and put their side of the story on here, and they've chosen to obstruct. And now some of his people haven't. It was interesting to me they used some of that brief Rudy Giuliani deposition that they got. I remember the day that that was like, oh, and then it abruptly ended, but they did get a little something to use. All right, let me bring in uh, Washington, NBC Washington correspondent Yamish Alcindor. Uh, Yamish, we've, we've, as I mentioned when we came in out, of the, out of the break, there were some chilling moments today. One of them was uh, Judge Mike Ludig when he talked about what he would do if he were uh, the representative for the vice president during that period. Judge Michael Ludig, a uh, Republican conservative judge, said something that I thought was so chilling and so stark. He said, I would have laid my body across the road if former Vice President Pence had tried to obey what he saw as an unconstitutional order by former Correct. President Trump to overturn the 2020 election. And he called it constitutional mischief that would have led to a revolution and a constitutional crisis. What's important about that, and talking to sources that I've been texting with um, during this hearing, is that ultimately it was Vice President Pence's body that was laid across the line for this. And it was stark to hear Mark Short, of course, the chief of staff for, for Pence, say that he was trying to make sure that his, that his security was going to be intact and ready, because he knew that this split between Pence and Trump was going to go public. So that tells you a little bit about just how scared they were in that president, in the vice president's office. I also think it's interesting that um, jo Greg Jacobs said that it was Pence's instinct immediately before all of the sort of constitutional studying, before all of the different debates with Eastman and other people, it was his instinct that this was wrong, what former President Trump was telling him to do. And he went right back to the country's founding, saying that in 1789, the founders, the framers of the Constitution would not, after splitting power among different branches of the government after splitting from King George III, they would not have turned around and said only the vice president could pick the president. That tells me something uh, about the state of mind that Pence was in as he was making this decision. Also, I've been texting with the ethics lawyer who said, well, this might feel in the weeds and slow and methodical. This is critical to establishing criminal intent on the part of former President Trump and others around him. So while legal experts are, are, are somewhat familiar with how slow this is going, there are a lot of lawyers who are telling me that this is is the way you build a case if you're trying to get some criminal charges. Well, you may sure about to, uh, uh, to gavel back in, but quickly, let's put that to criminal defense attorney and NBC analyst Danny Savalas. Danny, what about it? It reminds me of what you would call in criminal court prosecutorial overload. They are putting every piece of evidence out there when really they probably could have just put the text of the 12th Amendment up, point to it, and say, <laughs> this is pretty unambiguous, folks. All right, Danny, we're watching uh, the uh, members of the committee re-enter the room. Uh, they have been running pretty pretty much on time uh, with, with these hearings, keeping to the 10 minutes allotted uh, for the break. But they will continue. This is the, the second half of the hearing, uh, and they will continue to try and, and, and carve this narrative of a vice president who was uh, being hit, you know, multiple ways. Uh, uh, in an effort to turn the election, to essentially reject the elect electors votes. Committee will be in order. Gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar, is re recognized. I'd now like to turn to the events of January 6, 2021, which turned out to be a fateful day in our nation's history. Despite the fact that the vice president consistently told the president that he did not have and would not want the power to decide the outcome of the presidential election, Donald Trump continued to pressure the vice president, both publicly and privately. As you will hear, things reached a boiling point on January 6th, and the consequences were disastrous. 
in the middle of the night on January 5th into the morning of the 6th around 1 a.m., President Trump tweeted at the vice president, meaning that the comments in response to the president's tweet would also show up on the vice president's Twitter feed. The tweet stated that the vice president could, quote, come through for us and send it back to the states. Then around 8 a.m. on January 6th, President Trump again tweeted, this time to say that the vice president could send it back to the states and, quote, we win, and that this is the time for extreme courage. Mr. Short told us during his deposition that the Vice President started a meeting on January 6th in prayer. Here is what Mr. Short said. You arrived at the Vice President's residence. Um, as would often be the case, I recall that um, knowing it would be an important day, um, we gathered in prayer. and. Um, Often that would be something the staff member would, would lead, so it would have just been at that time, I believe, uh, the vice president, myself, Greg, and Chris, mm -hmm. and um, we would have just asked for guidance and wisdom, knowing that the day was going to be a challenging one. Mr. Jacob, did you go to the vice president's residences on the morning of January 6th? Yes. Who else was with you? Um, Mark Short, uh, Devin O'Malley, our communications director, and uh, Chris Hodgson, our legislative affairs director. And did the vice president have a call with the president that morning? He did. Were you with the vice president during the call? So we had been um, putting the, the, the vice president had finalized his statement overnight. We were in the process of proofing it so that we could get that out. Um, and we were told that a call had come in from the president. The vice president stepped out of the room to take that call, and no staff went with him. The president had several family members with him in the Oval that morning for that call. I'd like to show you what they and others told the select committee about that call, along with never-before-seen photographs of the president on that call from the National Archives. When I got in, uh, somebody called me and said that the family and others were in the Oval, and do I want to come up? So I, I went upstairs. Uh, and who do you recall being in the Oval Office? Uh, Don Jr., Eric, Laura, Kimberly, I believe Meadows was there. At some point, Ivanka came in. It wasn't a specific, it, formal discussion. It was very sort of loose and casual. So then you said at some point there's a telephone conversation between the president and the vice president, is that correct? Yes. When I entered the office the second time, he was on the telephone with who I later found out to be was the, the vice president. Could you hear the vice president or only hear the president's end? I only hear the president's end. But at some point it started off as a calmer tone and everything and then became heated. The conversation was, was Pretty heated. I think till it became somewhat, you know, louder tone. I don't think anyone was paying attention to it initially. Did you hear any part of the phone call, even if just the the end that the president was speaking from? I did, yes. All right, and what did you hear? So as I was dropping off the note, um, I, I, my memory, I remember hearing the word wimp. Either he called him a wimp. I don't remember if he said, you are a wimp, you'll be a wimp. Wimp is the word I remember. It's also been reported that the president said to the vice president that something to the effect of, you don't have the courage to make a hard decision. 
Worse, I don't remember exactly either, but something like that. Yeah. Do you being a, you, like being you're not tough enough to make the call. It was a different tone than I'd heard him take um, with the vice president before. Did Miss Trump share with you any more details about what had happened, or any details about what had happened in the Oval Office that morning? That her dad had just had an upsetting conversation with the vice president. Do you recall anything about her demeanor, either during the meeting or when you encountered her in Dan Scavino's office? Uh, I don't remember specifically. I mean, I think she was uncomfortable over the fact that there was obviously that type of interaction between the two of them. Something to the effect, this is, the wording's wrong. I made the wrong decision four or five years ago. And the, the word that she relayed to that the president called the vice president, I apologize for being impolite, but do you rem remember what she said her father called him? The P word. Mr. Jacob, how would you describe the demeanor of the vice president following the call, following that call with the president? When he came back into the room, I'd say that he was steely, determined, uh, grim. Of course, the most dangerous part of what Donald Trump did on January 6th was what he did himself. As will be discussed in detail in a future hearing, our investigation found that early drafts of the January 6th ellipse speech prepared for the president included no mention of the vice president, but the president revised it to include criticism of the vice president and then further ad-libbed. Here is what the president said on January 6th after his call with Vice President Pence. I hope Mike is going to do the right thing. I hope so. I hope so. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify. And we become president, and you are the happiest people. And I actually... I just spoke to Mike. I said, Mike, that doesn't take courage. What takes courage is to do nothing. That takes courage. And then we're stuck with a president who lost the election by a lot. And we have to live with that for four more years. We're just not going to let that happen. And Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. And they want to recertify their votes. They want to recertify. But the only way that can happen is if Mike Pence agrees to send it back. So I hope Mike has the courage to do what he has to do. And I hope he doesn't listen to the rhinos and the stupid people that he's listening to. Of course, we all know what happened next. The president's words had an effect. President Trump's supporters became angry. When the vice president issued his public letter, the crowd at the Capitol erupted in anger. The rioters who had erected makeshift gallows began chanting, hang Mike Pence. Testimony in our investigation has made clear what the target of the rioters' ire was, Vice President Mike Pence. The rioters breached the Capitol at 2.13 p.m. Now let's take a look at what was going on at the White House at this time. We received testimony that the President's Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, was notified of the violence at the Capitol by 2 p.m., and likely earlier. The testimony further establishes that Mr. Meadows quickly informed the President and that he did so before the President issued his 2.24 p.m. tweet criticizing Vice President Pence for not having, quote, courage to do what needed to be done. Here is what the president wrote in his 2.24 p.m. tweet while the violence at the Capitol was going on. And here is what the rioters thought. 
nothing but a traitor, and he deserves to burn with the rest of them. So this, so I, this all escalated after Pence. What, what happened to Pence? Pence, Pence, didn't, yeah. Pence didn't do what we wanted. Pence voted against Trump. Okay, and that's when all this started? Yep, that's when we marched on the Capitol. We've been shot at with rubber bullets, tear gas. us, which apparently everybody knew he was going to, and the president mentioned it like five times when he talked. You can go back and watch the president's video. This is our capital. Let's be respectful to him. There's, there's four million people coming in, so there's a lot of control. We love the guys. We love the cops. It's only a matter of time. Justice is coming. Although the president's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, has refused to testify before this committee, Mr. Meadows' aide, Ben Williamson, and White House Deputy Press Secretary, Sarah Matthews, testified that Mr. Meadows went to the dining room near the Oval Office to tell the president about the violence at the Capitol before the president's 2.24 p.m. tweet. In future hearings, you'll hear more about exactly what was happening in the White House at that time. But here is what some White House staff told the Select Committee. Do you know where he went? Uh, yes, I followed him down the hallway, uh, and I followed him uh, into the outer oval corridor, which is the hallway between uh, the Oval Office hallway and the outer oval section of the Oval Office. Um, I followed him into that little corridor hallway. Um, I saw him walk into Outer Oval. Um, I maybe took a step into Outer Oval and then left. Uh, and I don't know where he went outside of that, but it looked like he was headed in the direction of the Oval Office. You know, we had all talked about at that point about how it was um, bad and the, um, you know, situation was getting out of hand. And um, uh, I know Ben Williamson and I were uh, conferring and uh, we thought that the president needed to tweet something and tweet something immediately. And um, I think when Kaylee gave us that order of don't say anything to the media, I told her that I thought the president needed to tweet something. And um, then I remember um, then I remember getting um, a notification on my phone. And I was sitting in a room with um, Roma and Ben, and um, we all got a notification. So we knew it was a tweet from the president. And we looked down, and it was um, a, a tweet about Mike Pence. Uh, I believe I had sent him a text uh, saying that we may want to put out some sort of statement uh, because the situation was, was getting a little hairy over at the Capitol. Um, and then it was common for after I would text him, uh, I would just go down and, and see him in person. You went down to speak with Mark Meadows after this. What was that conversation? Uh, very brief. I went down and told him the same thing I have in the text that I can recall. Um, and I, I don't remember anything that was said uh, between us other than I told him that. Uh, and to my recollection, he uh, immediately got up and, uh, and left his office. Our investigation found that immediately after the president's 2.24 p.m. tweet, the crowds both outside the Capitol and inside the Capitol surged. The crowds inside the Capitol were able to overwhelm the law enforcement presence, and the vice president was quickly evacuated from his ceremonial Senate office to a secure location within the Capitol complex. By 
2.24 p.m., the Secret Service had moved Vice President Pence from the Senate chamber to his office across the hall. The noise from the rioters became audible, at which point we recognized that maybe they had gotten into the building. Then, President Trump tweeted, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they were asked to previously certify. USA demands the truth. It was clear that it was escalating and escalating quickly. So then when that tweet, the Mike Pence tweet, um, was sent out, um, I remember us saying that that was the last thing that needed to be tweeted at that moment. The situation was already bad, and so it felt like he was pouring gasoline on the fire by tweeting that. 30 seconds later, rioters already inside the Capitol opened the East Rotunda door just down the hall. And just 30 seconds after that, rioters breached the crypt, one floor below the vice president. The Secret Service couldn't control the situation and do their job of keeping him safe. At 2.26 p.m., Secret Service rushed Vice President Pence down the stairs. I think they had been trying to figure out whether they had a clear route to get us to where there it was that they wanted to move us to. We moved pretty quickly down the stairs and through various hallways and tunnels to the secure location. Uh, upon arriving there, there was further discussion as to whether or not we were going to leave the Capitol complex or stay where we were. Vice President Pence and his team ultimately were led to a secure location where they stayed for the next four and a half hours, barely missing rioters a few feet away. Approximately 40 feet, that's all there was. 40 feet between the vice president and the mob. Mr. Jacob, you were there, seeing that for the first time. Does it surprise you to see how close the mob was to the evacuation route that you took? The 40 feet is the distance from me to you, roughly. I could hear the din of the rioters in the building while we moved, but I don't think I was aware that they were as close as that. Make no mistake about the fact that the vice president's life was in danger. A recent court filing by the Department of Justice explains that a confidential informant from the Proud Boys told the FBI that the Proud Boys would have killed Mike Pence if given a chance. This witness, whom the FBI affidavit refers to as W1, stated that other members of the group talked about things they did that day, and they said that anyone they got their hands on, they would have killed, including Nancy Pelosi. W1 further stated that members of the Proud Boys said that they would have killed Mike Pence if given a chance. We understand that congressional leaders and others were evacuated from the Capitol complex during the attack. We'd like to show you what happened after the vice president was evacuated from the Senate. The Select Committee has obtained never-before-seen photos from the National Archives that show Vice President Pence sheltering in a secure underground location as rioters overwhelmed the Capitol. At 4.19 p.m., Vice President Pence is seen looking at a tweet the President had just sent, a tweet asking the rioters to leave the Capitol. After four and a half hours spent on working to restore order, the vice president returned to the Senate floor to continue the certification of electors. So Vice President Pence was a focus of the violent attack. Mr. Jacob, did the vice president leave the Capitol complex during the attack? He did not. Can you please explain why the vice president refused to leave the Capitol complex? When we got down to the secure location, Secret Service directed us to get into the cars, um, which I did, um, and then I noticed that the Vice President had not. So I got out of the car that I had gotten, in, gotten into, um, and I understood that the Vice President had refused to get into uh, the car. Um, the, the head of his Secret Service detail, Tim, had said, I assure you we're not going to drive out of the building without your permission. And the Vice President had said something to the effect of, Tim, 
I know you, I trust you, but you're not the one behind the wheel. And the vice president did not want to take any chance that um, the world would see the vice president of the United States fleeing the United States Capitol. He was determined that we would complete the work that we had um, set out to do that day, that it was his constitutional duty to see through, um, and that the rioters who had breached the Capitol would not have the satisfaction of um, disrupting the proceedings beyond the day on which they were supposed to be completed. Let me see if I understand this right. You were told to get in the cars, and how many of the vice president's staff got in the cars while well, he did not? Most of us. During our investigation, we received testimony that while the vice president was in a secure location within the Capitol complex, he continued the business of government. We understand that the vice president reached out to congressional leaders, like the acting secretary of defense and others, to check on their safety and to address the growing crisis. In addition, the Vice President's Chief of Staff, Mark Short, made several calls to senior government officials. Here's Mr. Short's testimony regarding his call with Representative Kevin McCarthy. He indicated that uh, he had had some conversation. I don't recall whether it was the tr with the President or with somebody at the White House, but I think he he expressed uh, frustration that uh, um, not taking the circumstances as seriously as they should at that moment. All right. So Mr. McCarthy indicated he'd been in touch with someone at the White House, and he conveyed to you that they weren't taking this as seriously as they should. You yes. Have to, you have to answer yes, yes. or no. Yes. Okay. While the Vice President made several calls to check on the safety of others, it was his own life that was in great danger. Mr. Jacob, did Donald Trump ever call the Vice President to check on his safety? He did not. Mr. Jacob, how did Vice President Pence and Mrs. Pence react to that? With frustration. Mr. Jacob, immediately before you and the Vice President were evacuated to a secure location within the Capitol, you hit send on an email to John Eastman explaining why his legal theory about the Vice President's role was wrong. You ended your email by stating that, quote, thanks to your bullshit, we are now under siege. We'll take a look at that email. Now, Dr. Eastman, replied, and this is hard to believe, but his reply back to you was, the siege is because you and your boss, presumably referring to the Vice President of the United States, did not do what was necessary to allow this to be aired in a public way so the American people can see for themselves what happened. Mr. Jacob, later that day you wrote again to Dr. Eastman. Let's show that email on the screen. In that email, you wrote, and I quote, did you advise the president that in your professional judgment, the vice president does not have the power to decide things unilaterally? And you ended that email saying, it does not appear that the president ever got the memo. Dr. Eastman then replied, he's been so advised. And he ends his email with, quote, but you know him, once he gets something in his head, it's hard to get him to change course, close quote. Mr. Jacob, when Dr. Eastman wrote, once he gets something in his head, it's hard to get him to change course, did you understand the he in that email to refer to the President of the United States? I did. Uh, and Mr. Jacob, did you hear from Dr. Eastman further after the riot had been quelled? And if so, what did he ask? Late that evening, after the joint session had been reconvened, um, the Vice President had given a statement to the nation saying that violence was not going to win, freedom wins, um, and that the people were going to get back to doing their work. Um, it, later that evening, um, Mr. Eastman emailed me to point out that, in his view, the Vice President's speech uh, to the nation um, violated the Electoral Count Act, 
that the Electoral Count Act had been violated because the debate on Arizona had not been completed in two hours. Um, of course, it couldn't be since there was an intervening riot of several hours. Um, <clears throat> and that the speeches that the majority and minority leaders had been allowed to make also violated the Electoral Count Act because they hadn't been counted against the debate time. And then he implored me, now that we have established that the Electoral Count Act um, isn't so sacrosanct as you have made it out to be, I implore you one last time, can the Vice President please do what we've been asking him to do these last two days, suspend the joint session, send it back to the states. And we'll show you the text of that email, which Dr. Eastman wrote at 11.44 p.m. on January 6th. So after the attack on the Capitol and after law enforcement had secured the Capitol, he still wrote, as you described, quote, so now that the precedent has been set that the Electoral Count Act is not quite so sacrosanct as was previously claimed, I implore you to consider one more relatively minor violation and adjourn for 10 days to allow the legislatures to finish their investigations. So even after the attack on the Capitol had been quelled, Dr. Eastman requested, in writing no less, that the vice president violate the law by delaying the certification and sending the question back to the states. Is that correct, Mr. Jacob? It is. Did you eventually share Dr. Eastman's proposal with Vice President Pence? Uh, not right at that time, because the vice president was completing uh, the work um, that it was his duty to do. But a day or two later, back at the White House, I did show him the, um, that final email from Mr. Eastman. And what was Vice President Pence's reaction when you showed him the email where Dr. Eastman, after the attack on the Capitol, still asked that the vice president delay certification and send it back to the states? He said, that's rubber room stuff. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Wood. He said it's rubber room stuff? Yes, Congressman. What did you interpret that to mean? I understood it to mean that after having seen play out um, what happens when you convince people that there is a decision to be made in the Capitol legitimately about who is to be the president and the consequences of that, that he was still pushing us to do uh, what uh, he had been asking us to do for the previous two days that that was certifiably crazy. We know that the vice president did not do what Dr. Eastman requested because he presided over the completion of the counting of electoral votes late in that evening. The number of electors appointed to vote for president of the United States is 538. Within that whole number, a majority is 270. The votes for president of the United States are as follows. Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware has received 306 votes. Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida has received 232 votes. The whole number of electors appointed to vote for Vice President of the United States is 538. Within that whole number, a majority is 270. The votes for Vice President of the United States are as follows. Kamala D. Harris of the state of California has received 306 votes. Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana has received 232 votes. The announcement of the state of the vote by the President of the Senate shall be deemed a sufficient declaration of the persons elected President and Vice President of the United States, each for the term beginning on the 20th day of January 2021 and shall be entered together with the list of the votes on the journals of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Mr. Jacob, we heard earlier that you and the Vice President and the team started January 6th with a prayer. You faced a lot of danger that day, and this is a personal question, but how did your faith guide you on January 6th? Um, my faith really sustained me through it. Um, I, down in the secure location, um, pulled out my Bible 
um, read through it, um, and uh, just took great comfort. Um, Daniel 6 uh, was where I went, and um, in Daniel 6, uh, Daniel has become the second in command of Babylon, a pagan nation, but he completely faithfully serves. He refuses an order from the king that he cannot follow, and he does his duty um, in cons consistent with his oath to God. And I felt that that's what had played out that day. It spoke to you? Yes. At the end of the day, Mark Short sent the vice president a text message with a Bible verse. Here's what he told the select committee. Okay. 3.50 in the morning when we finally adjourned and headed our own ways, I remember, you know, texting the vice president a, a passage from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 about, um, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. He started his day with a prayer and ended his day with a Bible verse. I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. White House attorney Eric Hirschman testified that the next day, January 7th, he received a call from Dr. Eastman. Here is Mr. Hirschman's account of that call. The day after, uh, Eastman, I don't remember why he called me, He's in a, or he texted me or called me, wanted to talk with me, and he said he couldn't reach others. And he started to ask me about something dealing with Georgia and preserving something potentially for appeal. Uh, and I said to him, are you out of your effing mind? Right? I, said, I said, I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth from now on. Orderly transition. And I screamed and said, I don't want to hear any other effing words coming out of your mouth no matter what other than orderly transition, repeat those words to me. And I figured that eventually he said orderly transition. I said, good, John. Now I'm going to give you the best free legal advice you're ever getting in your life. Get a great effing criminal defense lawyer. You're going to need it. And then I hung up on him. In fact, just a few days later, Dr. Eastman emailed Rudy Giuliani and requested that he be included on a list of potential recipients of a presidential pardon. Dr. Eastman's email stated, quote, I've decided that I should be on the pardon list if that is still in the works. Dr. Eastman did not receive his presidential pardon. So let's see what Dr. Eastman did as a result when he was deposed by this committee. I assert my Fifth Amendment right against uh, being compelled to be a witness against myself. Did the Trump legal team ask you to prepare a memorandum regarding the vice president's role in the counting of electoral votes at the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2020? Yeah. Dr. Eastman, did you advise the president of the United States that the vice president could reject electors from seven states and declare that the president had been reelected? Yeah. Dr. Eastman, the first sentence of the memo starts off by saying, seven states have transmitted dual slates of electors to the president of the Senate. Is that statement in this memo true? Yeah. Did President Trump authorize you to discuss publicly your January 4th, 2021 conversation with him? Yeah. So is it your position that you can discuss in the media direct conversations you had with the President of the United States, but you will not discuss those same conversations with this committee? Yeah. Dr. Eastman pled the fifth a hundred times. Finally, let's hear from a federal court judge, the only one to date who has opined on whether the President was involved in criminal activity. Page 36 of Judge Carter's ruling says, quote, based on the evidence, the court finds it more likely than not that, the pres that President Trump 
corruptly attempted to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. Page 40 of the ruling says, quote, based on the evidence, the court finds that it is more likely than not that President Trump and Dr. Eastman dishonestly conspired to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. And page 44, Dr. Eastman and President Trump launched a campaign to overturn a democratic election, an action unprecedented in American history. Their campaign was not confined to the ivory tower. It was a coup in search of a legal theory. Mr. Jacob, what would have happened to our democracy if Vice President Pence had gone along with this plan and certified Donald Trump as the winner of the 2020 election? So there would have been short-term and long-term effects. The short-term I previously described, a constitutional jump ball situation, political chaos in Washington, lawsuits, um, and who knows what happening in the streets. And you would have had the Vice President of the United States having declared um, that the outcomes of these state elections were incorrect. Um, so for all of those reasons, um, there would have been significant short-term consequences. But in the long term, um, we would have established a situation where a vice president would have asserted that one person could have the authority to determine the outcome of an election, which is antithetical to everything in our democracy, is antithetical to the rule of law. And so it would have been um, uh, significant impacts, both in the short and the long term. Judge Ludig, in the statement you released earlier today, you wrote that the efforts by President Trump to overturn the 2020 election were, quote, the most reckless, insidious, and calamitous failures in both legal and political judgment in American history. What did you mean by that? Exactly what I said, Congressman. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Jacob. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I want that back. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, this was an informative hearing, a powerful hearing. I'm grateful for your leadership and the leadership of the distinguished vice chair. Donald Trump knew he lost the 2020 election, but he could not bring himself to participate in the peaceful transfer of power. So he latched on to a scheme that once again, he knew was illegal. And when the vice president refused to go along with it, he unleashed a violent mob against him. When we began, I asked how we got to this place. And I think the answer to that question starts with the fact that people in positions of power put their political party before their country. It cannot be allowed to continue. I'll yield back now, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney, for a closing statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to my colleague, Representative Aguilar, and thank you very much uh, to our witnesses today, Mr. Jacob and Judge Ludig. Thank you for, for being here with us. Um, we have seen so far in, in our hearings that President Trump knew that his claims of a stolen election were false. You have seen that he knew that Mike Pence could not legally refuse to count electoral votes. And you have seen what, my, what President Trump did to pressure Mike Pence into taking illegal action. Over the course of our next hearings, you will see information about President Trump's efforts, John Eastman efforts, the Trump legal team's efforts to apply pressure to Republican state legislatures, state officials, and others. Judge Carter has recently written, quote, Dr. Eastman's actions in these few weeks indicate that his and President Trump's pressure campaign to stop the electoral count did not end with Vice President Pence. 
It targeted every tier of federal and state elected officials. We will examine all of those threats, and we will examine the Trump team's determination to transmit materially false electoral slates from multiple states to officials of the executive and legislative branches of our government. We will examine the pressures put on state legislatures to convene to reverse lawful election results. An honorable man receiving the information and advice that Mr. Trump received from his campaign experts and his staff, a man who loved his country more than himself, would have conceded this election. Indeed, we know that a number of President Trump's closest aides urged him to do so. This committee will address all of these issues in greater detail in the coming weeks. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Young lady yields back. Judge Ludic and Mr. Jacob, our nation owes you a great debt for your knowledge, integrity, and your loyalty to our Constitution. You and Vice President Pence are exactly the people our nation needed at a critical time. You had the courage to do what was right. In the weeks leading up to January 6th, many people failed this test when they had to choose between their oath to the country or the demands of Donald Trump. But there were others who, like you, stood tall in the face of intimidation and put our democracy first. They include the judges who rejected the bogus claims of election fraud, the senior Justice Department officials who stood up to Donald Trump, and the state officials whom we will hear from at our next hearing. We are deeply grateful to your courage and devotion to our country. There are some who think the danger has passed that even though there were violence and a corrupt attempt to overturn the presidential election, the system worked. I look at it another way. Our system nearly failed and our democratic foundation destroyed, but for people like you. Judge Ludic, I want to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts on the ongoing threat. You've written the clear and present danger to our democracy. Now is that former President Donald Trump and other political allies appear prepared to seize the presidency in 2024 if Mr. Trump or one of his anointed candidates is not elected by the American people. What do you mean by this? Mr. Chairman, I'm honored beyond words by your words. I was honored on January 6, 2021, then also honored beyond words to have been able to come to the aid of Vice President Mike Pence. I prayed that day, just like the Vice President prayed that day. I believe we may have prayed the, the same prayer to the same God. I prayed that same prayer with my wife this morning before I came into these hearings. I have written, as you said, Chairman Thompson, that today, almost two years after that fateful day in January 2021 that still Donald Trump and his 
allies, and supporters. are a clear and present danger to American democracy. That's not because of what happened on January 6th. It's because to this very day, the former president, his allies and supporters pledge that in the presidential election of 2024, if the former president or his anointed successor as the Republican Party presidential candidate were to lose that election, that they would attempt to overturn that 2024 election in the same way that they attempted to overturn the 2020 election, but succeed in 2024, where they failed in 2020. I don't speak those words lightly. I would have never spoken those words ever in my life except that that's what the former president and his allies are telling us, as I said in that New York Times op-ed, wherein I was speaking about the Electoral Count Act of 1887, the former president and his allies are executing that blueprint uh, for 2024 in open and plain view of the American public. I repeat, I would have never uttered one single one of those words unless the former president and his allies were candidly and proudly speaking those exact words to America. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today for these proceedings. Thank you again, uh, Judge Ludwig. As a part of the select committee's charge to make recommendations that are informed by other investigative findings, we will be reviewing the views shared by Judge Ludet and other experts on potential improvements to the Electoral Count Act, among a range of other initiatives. I know the information we presented over the last week is shocking. The idea that a president of the United States would orchestrate a, key, a scheme to stay in power after the people have voted him out of office. We are able to present this information because so many witnesses have cooperated with our probe. But the fact is, there are more people with direct knowledge, with evidence, germane to our investigation. I ask those who might be on the fence about cooperating to reach out to us. The committee's website address is being displayed behind me, january6.house.gov. There you can view the evidence we presented in our hearings and find a tip line 
to submit any information you might think would be helpful for our investigation. And despite how you might not think it's important, send us what you think. And I thank those who sent us evidence for their bravery and patriotism. Without objections, members will be permitted 10 business days to submit statements for the record, including opening remarks and additional questions for the witnesses. The chair requests those in the hearing room remain seated until the Capitol Police have excluded members from the room. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Well, the second half of that hearing uh, focused on the threats to Vice President Mike Pence when he did not go along with the president's attempt to overturn the election on January 6th. Some riveting testimony in the second portion of the day. The committee laying out how the day January 6th played out. First, a heated phone call between President Trump and Vice President Pence, where the president continued to pressure him to go along with his plan, calling him derogatory terms. Uh, we heard multiple witnesses describe what it was like to be in the Oval Office at that moment as the president raised his voice uh, using crude language to describe uh, what he thinks the vice president would be if he didn't go along with the plan uh, to uh, decertify the election. Uh, we saw the rioters marching on Capitol chanting, hang, hang Mike Prince. We see, uh, Pence. We see that in a different perspective now. The committee showed how the vice president was rushed to safety as the mob breached the Capitol building, coming within only 40 feet of the vice president. They also revealed a series of never-before-seen photos of the vice president, uh, Pence, after he had been evacuated, including him learning of a tweet from President Trump in the middle of the violence, where he told supporters the vice president didn't have the courage to do what should have been done. The committee says after the tweet, the crowds both inside and outside the Capitol surged, putting the vice president's life in further danger. NBC News Chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker is with me, along with NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Chuck, let me uh, begin with you. The first part of the day, the first procession was really establishing this pattern of trying to get the vice president to go along with this right. scheme, the tweets, uh, what was said in the rallies, the conversations. The second half, though, felt like the bow that was put on this, taking us into the Oval Office, hearing the president's side of that a critical conversation. It was. And then, frankly, to find out after the riot was over, after the Capitol was cleared, they were, they were still, the president and John Eastman were still pressuring Mike Pence to somehow violate the Constitution, to violate the law. And, you know, putting, putting the details of that, hearing John Eastman plead the fifth for fear he's going to incriminate himself. So we're now at the point we heard the, the White House lawyer, Mr. Hirschman, essentially uh, give him that free legal advice in a very colorful way. The point is, is they are, and it's what we said after the first break, and it's more emphatic here, I think, especially this sort of what I would call the exclamation point of Eastman's videotape deposition where he's pleading the fifth constantly. It, it, it's almost confirming that he, kn he knowingly was violating the Constitution, that he knew everything he was advocating uh, was likely against the law. And then, of course, uh, if you want to, to, to use your words, the bow, the bow was him asking to be on the pardon list. Why do you need to be on a pardon list if you didn't do anything illegal? So, again, I think the methodical case that this committee continues to make is how it, they bring it back to Donald Trump. He was told multiple times this was against the law. This was told multiple times this was uh, in the uh, against, was unconstitutional, and he pushed for it anyway. And then oh, by the way, he didn't seem to mind or care that Mike Pence's life was put in danger by, uh, by the actions of the president. Let me bring in, bring in uh, Kristen right now. Kristen, uh, first of all, give us the view from the White House. That, that, you heard the description of what was happening there. Um, Sarah Matthews, one of the people yes. we heard from in one of the tape segments there, Deputy 
uh, press secretary yeah. there at the moment this is taking place. Part of what was so stark, Lester, in watching all of this back is that I was there at the White House, and those were the officials with whom I was interfacing, trying to get information about what President Trump was going to do. And so here you have the committee trying to fill in the blanks of what happened and what didn't happen. And what didn't happen is that he didn't send out a tweet saying, go home. The first tweet he sent out was attacking Mike Pence, and you heard Sarah Matthews there say that was the absolute wrong thing to do in that moment. And I can tell you, Sarah Matthews, Ben Williamson, the looks on their faces in real time as this was unfolding, Sarah Matthews had tears in her eyes. Ben Matthews seemed to be enraged that the president wasn't going out and saying something. And so this was the first time that you were really seeing officials around him break with President Trump in real time. Sarah Matthews wound up resigning later that day. I think it's important to note. But to go back to the point that Chuck was making, what we saw in the second part of this hearing, Lester, was really trying to connect the dots of the criminality that the um, hearing that the committee is trying to lay the groundwork and to make the case that this is what occurred. And remember, we started this week discussing the divide within the committee that some had said that, yes, there could be the possibility of a criminal referral to the Justice Department, others signifying that possibly there isn't. Whatever they wind up deciding, we know that the Department of Justice is watching. We know that the Attorney General is watching. Merrick Garland saying he's watching all of this very closely. And again, this part of the hearing really seemed aimed at connecting those dots of criminality. Uh, Chuck, we know that uh, many reject this hearing uh, as, as uh, a partisan witch hunt. You've heard all the criticism before. How much of a... Where does this leave a lot of Republicans who want to dismiss this, but if they're watching, have just watched a, a pretty compelling case that there was an effort to, if not discredit the vice president, to put his life, very life, in danger. Well, Lester, let's just go down the list of the witnesses we heard from today and their resumes. You heard Greg Jacob, uh, a lawyer for Mike Pence, certainly uh, at one point talking about his own ideology, how he views the Constitution. You know, he's a, 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 a I think he called himself a, a, a an originalist when it came to that. My point is, you know which side of the aisle he comes from ideologically. How about Judge Ludic? Judge Ludic, who was essentially the runner-up for uh, to Alito for a Supreme Court seat. You heard from Mark Short, the vice president's chief of staff. You know, you heard from White House staff. The point is, is that everybody that was talking in this, other than the questioners from the committee, were not just Republicans, Trump supporting Republicans at one time. So, you know, you, you, I, I think this is just extraordinarily difficult. If you've been an elected Republican here and you've wanted to walk this line of, of saying uh, you respect uh, the vice president, but you believe uh, uh, and you believe that, you know, hey, we've got to move, we can't, can't look backwards, got to move forward. You can't look at what, uh, what happened on January 6th anymore. Don't focus on that. I think it's really hard, really hard to walk away from that and, and sit here and somehow be both praising Pence and, and, and still acknowledging that somehow Donald Trump has some right to leadership in this country, because I think they're painting a pretty, a pretty, um, a pretty uh, str uh, horrible picture of Donald Trump's personal empathy And, and, for and Benny Pence. Thompson, if you note at the very end, of the, uh, basically making an appeal for anyone that has any information, almost suggesting, Kristen, mm -hmm. that he's kind of offering this as kind of a safe space to see so many people who were allies uh, of the president or supporters of the president now come to this place. That's right. And you have to wonder if more people will voluntarily want to come forward and give more information. I talked about the fact that Sarah Matthews resigned that day. She was one of a number of Trump officials who resigned that day. We know that the committee has reached out to many of them, to most of them. But will there be more people who want to lend their voice to this conversation? I heard from a former Trump official who said that it was so hard to watch this back, but really honed in on the fact that this underscored just how close Vice President Mike Pence came to real danger. And I think that that is a cornerstone to the case that the committee is building against former President Trump. You heard them say he was just 40 feet away from the rioters to imagine that. It, what divided them? A wall. A and I think that's terrifying for the American public to consume, but also for Republicans who may not have been ready to publicly break with former President Trump. That may change the equation for some people. All right, Garrett Hank is our senior Capitol Hill correspondent. He's uh, outside the committee uh, hearing room. Uh, Garrett, as I'm watching a lot of this transpire today, I'm thinking, did, I, did we know that? Did, you know, what, what's new, what's not new here? But realizing 
even things that we knew, they're now, we're now getting the witness testimony. We're getting kind of a fuller picture of what happened or what's reported to have happened. I agree with that, Lester. I mean, we covered the second impeachment of Donald Trump, which covered a lot of these same facts, but now we're seeing so much more detail, and I think the layering of the timelines here was especially useful in understanding exactly what happened, being able to see, you know, the tweet from President Trump at the same time that we're able to know Vice President Pence's location, and the challenge they would have, you know, as somebody who spends way too much time up here in these buildings, getting from Pence's ceremonial office down underground beneath the Capitol in the way that they describe being only about 40 feet from the uh, the mob would have been very challenging. I mean, it's difficult to move around in that space, you know, especially when you had folks already having breached the building and seeing the graphics and hearing the timeline, seeing those never before seen images of Pence deep underneath the Capitol, you know, working surrounded by concrete slabs and trash cans. I can tell you that the safe locations that members of Congress were taken to on that day uh, were much more comfortable comfortably appointed than that, um, to get that kind of granular detail that we've lacked since the 6th um, has real value, I think, in understanding this. And I you know, was here on the 6th, and I've covered it basically every day since. And then I think the other part of this is the, the sort of late arriving information. For example, uh, the email from John Eastman to Rudy Giuliani. You know, we know that John Eastman's emails have been the subject of intense litigation by this committee, uh, lawsuits in federal court to try to get their hands on it, Eastman claiming some attorney-client privilege over some of these things. Um, being able to draw that information out just really within the last couple of weeks and present it tells a very different and more layered story about what was going on behind the scenes uh, during all of this than, than we've ever been able to understand before, even when, uh, you know, the, the impeachment managers in that second Trump impeachment were trying to put together a similar narrative. All right, Garrett, thank you. Yamisha Sindor is our our NBC News Washington correspondent Yamish, let's 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 talk about the subplot here uh, that's been offered. That this is not only about an event that happened in January of 2021, but also it's been alluded to an event that uh, is is still happening on some levels. Certainly, Lester. And what's striking about this second part of the hearing is that there really is this picture being painted of former President Trump being a danger in the past and in the future. Of course, in the future, um, the Judge Ludic, Judge Ludic, really did paint a picture that says that former President Trump is plainly telling Americans that he would try again where he and try to succeed where he failed in 2020 and try to do something in 2024 to overturn an election if a GOP candidate is not chosen. So Judge Ludic here is really saying, pay attention. This isn't something that's in the past. This isn't something that has passed forward. Um, that this is something that people should be worried about now. I also think it's really important that when you think about the past, you think about the fact that Pete Aguilar said that an informant of the Proud Boys said that if former Vice President Mike Pence was found, that that group would have killed him. It's very, it's been insinuated that Mike Pence was very much in danger. But for the lawmaker to say that very clearly tells you exactly how much danger Mike Pence was in. I also think it's really striking when I'm talking to folks that they're really saying that Mike Pence, in taking the stand and taking a political risk, is really about trying to make sure that our country does not devolve into a democracy that falls apart. So it's really important, I think, that, that, that President Trump was really, really being detailed as someone who was bent on taking power. and could take power again if he doesn't get what he wants. And it's important, of course, when I've been talking to my sources, that these are Republicans saying that these are people that were close to Mike Pence, that were close to former President Trump, saying that our democracy hangs on the whims of whether or not a man like Trump, who could even send out a tweet criticizing Mike Pence as he was running for his life and going to that secret location, that he is someone who cannot be trusted with any sort of power, political power or otherwise, in the future. All right. Uh, let me quickly go before we run out of time here. I want to go to criminal defense attorney Danny Savalas. Danny, anything you're seeing here that would be a roadmap for the Justice Department or something that they can't ignore? Yes, the committee is making the case and cutting off all of the avenues of retreat for both Eastman and Trump when they will maybe inevitably claim, I believed with my heart, in good faith, that what I was doing was correct. They've done a great job with Eastman showing that numerous people told him this is not correct. Again, you could show him the Twelfth Amendment and say, the Twelfth Amendment says that you can't do this. And in the face of all that, 
he persisted, Eastman. So the case is becoming stronger against Eastman, but Trump has the same defense to criminal prosecution that he has to almost everything else, which is essentially, I was too ignorant to know any better. All right, Dandy, thank you. Quick final thought now from our chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker. Well, Lester, I'll be watching to see how effectively they continue to connect these dots. We know that the next hearings will focus on a range of issues from the pressure campaign within the Department of Justice, within the states, and then we are going to get an even more detailed look of what unfolded on January 6th itself. And so it will be incumbent upon the committee to keep this momentum going and to keep these dots connected. In their minds, the there is showing that, that President Trump was the leader of all this, but but they're still not the there is not there yet. That's right. They're going to continue to try to connect all of this back to former President Trump and to show and to prove that he knew what he was doing. Was all right, crossing Kristen the Walker. Line. Thank you. We are going to have much more tonight on NBC Nightly News, and special coverage continues right now with Chuck Todd and Meet the Press Now. For now, I'm Lester Holt. Thank you for watching, everyone. Good day. Well, here we go. Another hearing. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd. Just a few minutes ago, you saw the January 6th committee wrapped up. It is third public hearing. The focus of this one was Trump's pressure campaign on Mike Pence in order to overturn the election. The hearing was essentially divided up into two parts. First was the White House's pressure campaign on Vice President Pence to somehow accept the analysis that he had the power to overturn the results of the election using a theory they themselves knew was unconstitutional. The committee presented a barrage of evidence that the vice president had no power to overturn the election, that the vice president never believed he had that power, and that Trump was told over and over again that the idea was unconstitutional, that he knew that what he was telling the vice president to do was illegal, and so did the people around him. But they pushed it anyway. The second part of the hearing laid out more of the danger Pence was uh, was in on January 6th when he did not cave to the pressure to somehow suspend that uh, the counting of the votes in order to allow more time to overturn the election. In the first part of the hearing, we also heard that both Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman admitted that their legal theory was bogus and wouldn't hold up in a court. And yet they both continued to promote it. Eastman was dismissive about what the dire consequences could be. Here's part of the video testimony of Eric Hirschman who was the White House attorney at the time, as well as testimony today from Greg Jacob, the top White House lawyer, to Vice President Pence. I said, hold on a second, I want to understand what you're saying. You're saying that you believe the Vice President, acting as President of the Senate, can be the sole decision maker as to, under your theory, who becomes the next President of the United States? And you said yes. I said, are you out of your effing mind? I said, you're completely crazy. I said, you're going to turn around and tell 78 plus million people in this country that your theory is this is how you're going to invalidate their votes because you think the election was stolen? And I said, they're not going to tolerate that. I said, you're going to cause riots in the streets. And he said, words to the effect of there's been violence in the history of our country, Eric, to protect the democracy or protect the republic. He had come into that meeting trying to persuade us that there was some validity to his theory. I viewed it as my objective to persuade him to acknowledge he was just wrong. And I thought this had to be one of the most powerful arguments. I mean, John, back in 2000, you weren't jumping up and saying Al Gore had this authority to do that. You would not want Kamala Harris to be able to exercise that kind of authority in 2024 when I hope Republicans will win the election, and I know you hope that too, John. And he said, absolutely. Al Gore did not have a basis to do it in 2000. Kamala Harris shouldn't be able to do it in 2024, but I think you should do it today. And in just a few words, uh, Judge uh, Michael Luddick uh, gave this advice to Pence. He put this whole thing in context and said that if Pence had followed Trump's orders, there would have been a constitutional crisis.
that declaration of Donald Trump as the next president would have plunged America into what I believe would have been tantamount to a revolution within a constitutional crisis. In my view, and I'm only one man, would have been the first constitutional crisis since the founding of the Republic. Just to remind folks, Michael Luddick was essentially the runner-up to Sam Alito uh, for George W. Bush when he was looking for Supreme Court justices back in his term. The committee then focused on the true danger Pence faced on January 6th itself when he chose to certify the election results. Rioters were within 40 feet of the vice president as he was rushed away for safety. I could hear the din of the rioters in the building while we moved, but I don't think I was aware that they were as close as that. Make no mistake about the fact that the vice president's life was in danger. A recent court filing by the Department of Justice explains that a confidential informant from the Proud Boys told the FBI that the Proud Boys would have killed Mike Pence if given a chance. That was pretty chilling. Ali Vitale is on Capitol Hill. Vaughn Hilliard uh, he, he's covering my, has covered Mike Pence for us since the 2016 campaign. Also have Chuck Rosenberg, a former senior FBI official, former U.S. attorney, uh, and the Washington Post. Carol Lennig is an NBC News contributor. Uh, let me start with Ali Vitale. She's outside where all the action is. And Ali, I think the importance of today, uh, there's a couple of big pieces of new information. The pardon ask uh, by yeah. John Eastman to Rudy Giuliani. I think it's a preview of more to come. But the timeline today is what to me was so important to see all of the public comments that the president said about Mike Pence, putting into the context of yeah. when he knew full well what was legal and what wasn't legal. Yeah, that's absolutely right, because to me, especially in the opening phase of that hearing, it really very much seemed like a ping pong ball going back and forth between John Eastman and the vice president's office over different plans that Eastman was trying to throw at the wall to overturn the election. And at each turn, Vice President Pence and his team being very clear that they were saying no, that they did not see the legal basis for this. And at some points, even saying that no one should be able to have the power of one singular person being over to being able to overturn the results of the election. I think that was a very stunning piece of it, the committee successfully showing that there was a sustained pressure campaign both publicly and privately on the former vice president. And then, of course, those chilling hours on January 6th where Pence was whisked off the floor, put in a secure location, and spent several hours there. His team, of course, saying that when Secret Service told them to get in the car, they got in the car. But, of course, they didn't leave that secure location. Pence was determined to stay, continuing to do his work there. And in the hearing room, people who may have been zoning out or not exactly paying attention, they really did snap to attention, eyes glued to that screen when the never-before-seen photos of what Pence was doing in that bunker were shown, specifically that picture of when he was viewing the tweet that Trump himself sent about the rioters and about what was going on at the Capitol. Some really, really stunning moments. And frankly, they're the ones that the committee is pointing to here in the halls of Congress as we've been talking to committee members as they've been leaving, Chuck. Fascinating there. Uh, let me bring in Vaughn Hilliard. You know, Vaughn, Mike Pence is not personally cooperated with the committee. That doesn't mean he's not cooperating with the committee. But he has... The committee's also avoided officially trying to get him to cooperate. Uh, it seems to me that the full cooperation of Mark Short and the full cooperation of Greg Jacob has been enough for the committee to essentially believe they're getting Mike Pence's cooperation as well. Is that fair? Is that a fair way to put it? 
Correct, and I'm told that every single individual who worked for the former vice president has agreed and cooperated with the subpoenas that were handed to them. And you just saw that here play out with Craig Jacob, but with Mark Short. And the January 6th committee feels like that those individuals are have been able to paint uh, the picture of what it took place around uh, the former vice president, not only in those two months ahead of January 6th after the 2020 election, but there on the day of. And I think the two striking moments that really played out here were, one, that phone call that about 15 minute phone call uh, just about uh, two hours before Mike Pence headed to Capitol Hill to oversee the certification process in which Donald Trump, while Mike Pence was still at the Naval Observatory, uh, gave Pence a phone call. Pence stepped aside yep. from his advisors at that time, but Donald Trump made that call from the Oval Office. And that is when numerous individuals, including Ivanka Trump herself, as well as other Trump aides inside the West Wing, were listening in on that call. One of his aides, former body man uh, said that Donald Trump called right. Mike Pence directly there on January 6th a wimp. But then the other part, that other moment there was at 224. That's when Donald Trump sent out that tweet uh, as uh, well after the insurrection it had already begun and those the mob had already breached the Capitol in which he said that Donald, that Mike Pence did not have courage, did not show courage. And that is when those photos show there him looking at that tweet. Two minutes later is when you then see him whisked away from that holding room down below the Capitol complex here. And again, it gets at that idea of the obstruction of the process, not just the life of Mike Pence and his family that were put in danger, but also the integrity of uh, the system that was to play out and ultimately what could have been uh, a, a, you know, a, a hindrance to this electoral college process from uh, being fulfilled that day, uh, a constitutional obligation that the vice president himself is the one who is supposed to fulfill. Carol Lennick, uh, you're watching, if you were having to write the lead piece uh, based on this hearing, where would you begin? I'm torn, really, really torn, actually, because on the one hand, there is a resounding sort of mosaic with all of the witnesses around Pence, his lawyer, his chief of staff, the pictures, as well as his, his informal legal advisor, former appellate judge Mike Ludig, all of these individuals showing that Trump had been told multiple times this idea is not legal, is not constitutional, and Trump pushed it nonetheless. But the other thing that really got me, actually, Chuck, was Eastman's request for a pardon. You'll remember that Eric Hirschman, who, who seemed to throw the um, F-bomb quite a bit in his conversations with people who were making this suggestion that they could just overturn the will of 78 million Americans and voters, um, he had said to Eastman, I have one good piece of advice for you. Get a great criminal defense lawyer as soon as you can. This is good advice. Well, Eastman asking for a pardon by email is yeah. a lot of consciousness of guilt, right? A lot of fear that he knew. What do you, and, he, and he, he stated it to multiple witnesses. He knew this wouldn't work, and he pushed it nonetheless. And, you know, Chuck Rosenberg, in fact, let me play the exchange, because I want to drill down more. Before we learn of the Eastman pardon, uh, some extraordinarily e extraordinary email exchanges between Mr. Jacob and Mr. Eastman after the riot. It is uh, collection number eight for my uh, producers in the control room. Play uh, the mash of number eight, please, on the Eastman email exchanges. You ended your email by stating that, quote, thanks to your we are now under siege. And Dr. Eastman replied, and this is hard to believe, but his reply back to you was, the siege is because you and your boss, presumably referring to the Vice President of the United States, did not do what was necessary to allow this to be aired in a public way so the American people can see for themselves what happened. He implored me, now that we have established that the Electoral Count Act um, isn't so sacrosanct as you have made it out to be, I implore you one last time, can the Vice President please do what we've been asking him to do these last two days, suspend the joint session, send it back to the states. A day or two later, back at the White House, I did show him the, um, that final email from Mr. Eastman. And what was Vice President Pence's reaction when you showed him the email where Dr. Eastman, after the attack on the Capitol, 
still asked that the vice president delay certification and send it back to the states. He said, that's rubber room stuff. So Chuck Rosenberg, I wrote down something at the start of this hearing, and it remains, have you committed a crime when you've asked someone else to commit a crime that you know is against the law? And essentially, the picture this committee, I feel like, has painted pretty well is the former, the former president was told numerous times it was unconstitutional, it was against the law, everything he was asking Mike Pence to do, and yet he pursued it anyway. At what point is that a crime? Yeah, it's a great question, Chuck. So the legal answer is that there are different ways uh, for somebody to ask someone else to commit a crime and be culpable for it. So if you and I conspire to commit a crime, if I solicit a crime, solicitation can be a crime, or if I aid and abet a crime, you rob a bank and I help you get a getaway car. So aiding and abetting, solicitation, conspiracy are Diane, all fact patterns that would fit what about. you're describing. But what's really interesting to me here is that, well, let me back up a sec. First of all, being a bad lawyer is not a crime, and I'm grateful for that every day. Mm -hmm. um, but being an unprincipled lawyer uh, and a bad lawyer and advocating for something that you know is false can be a crime. So we know from other witnesses today that Eastman knew, that Eastman knew that the theory he was propounding, what he was asking Vice President Pence to do, wasn't lawful. We knew it because Eastman admitted he would lose 9-0 in the Supreme Court. We knew uh, Eastman knew it was unlawful, improper, because he said it wouldn't pertain to uh, Vice President Gore in 2000 or to Kamala Harris in 2024. We knew that Eastman believed it to be unlawful because he acknowledged to Jacob uh, that it would violate the 1887 Electoral Count Act. So couple all of that with your question, can there be criminal liability for asking someone to do something that the law forbids? And I think the answer is yes. And let me follow up. when you. Look, asking for a pardon and pleading the fifth is not, uh, is not admitting a crime. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the court of public opinion, I can quote a guy named Donald Trump, when you're, when you're pleading the fifth over and over again and it's combined with the knowledge you're asking for a pardon, you're certainly raising some suspicion that you, that you think you committed a crime. Yeah, you sure are. But let me give you two different answers to that question. There's a legal answer, right? And the Supreme Court has said that invoking the fifth is something that is, it's a, a constitutional right for the guilty mm -hmm. and for the innocent, right? And when we are in court, and I was a federal prosecutor for a long time, you can't infer anything from someone's invocation of the fifth. But your point, Chuck, there's also a public relations appearance answer to that question. It looks awful. Now, it's not evidence of a crime, but it may be for all of us taking a peek into John Eastman's brain, which is not a comfortable place to be, frankly, um, a window, let me, let me mix metaphors, a window onto his soul, that he knows he did something wrong. He invoked the fifth to avoid answering questions that might incriminate him. That's his constitutional right. But who among us on this panel right now have ever asked for a pardon? Have any of us actually thought we needed that? I mean, that's rather extraordinary. Uh, Ali Vitali, uh, have we gotten confirmation that that most recent Eastman email is indeed from uh, the order where he was ordered to turn over more? There was sort of this, they were looking at what would qualify as attorney-client privilege and what would not. And there appeared yeah. to be a chunk of emails that did not qualify. Is this where this came from, Ali? Have we gotten that confirmed from the committee? Look, that's very likely, and the reason I say very likely is because the committee really does not like to engage with us on the nuts and bolts of where these things are coming from. Instead, they just consider it all part of the trove of documents that they've gotten. We know that a large swath of them have come from the National Archives. Of course, that's where places like those photos of the former vice president came from. It's fair to assume that that's where they got these Eastman emails. They also regularly like to point to the court case that helped them get these Eastman emails when they talk about the potential 
potential for criminal wrongdoing here because that federal judge is one of the few people with deep insight into what was in these emails. And of course, he deemed that there was likelihood of something criminal there, which is why the committee was thusly able to get their hands on them in the first place. So all of that is wrapped up in the legal battle, and it's something that we often hear about from the committee members. I think I would turn to another piece of this, though, too, because in the minutes before I came to the camera, admittedly a little bit late for your show, it's because I was talking to Chairman Benny Thompson, and one of the things we've been asking him about today is comments he made that they want to talk to Ginny Thomas. What he seemed to say to me when I said that she seemed amenable to talking to the committee was his response was that they had already sent her a letter. And so it seems like that outreach may have already happened. We know that Vice Chair Liz Cheney is in concurrence with the chairman of right. the committee, that Ginny Thomas is someone that they'd like to speak to. But a little bit of news there as we see that the committee is still clearly pushing ahead fact-finding, right. even as their narrative setting right now in these hearings. Uh, it's a very important. We're going to get more into the Ginny Thomas situation uh, after our first break in a few minutes. Uh, I want to get to you, uh, back to you, Von Hilliard. And there's sort of the, the larger, I've gotten the sense that Pence World has been looking forward to this day, meaning they kind of needed this cathartic moment of, look, there's a split. Everybody's been writing about it. What does the split mean? Well, there's, now, you, now folks understand it from the Pence point of view in a way that perhaps folks didn't before. And maybe if I could, Chuck, not just the Pence view, but Trump aides who we haven't heard speak out like this. It took a deposition, a subpoena for them to come before Congress to make these sorts of comments public. Uh, that also includes Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump. These are family members here because the Pence team is going to, if we're talking about a political future here, right, and, or if I may, the future of the democracy and where and what, whether the population at large here in this country believes the truth of the 2020 election, the, among Republican voters, Mike Pence needs help. We've gone from Ohio to West Virginia, Wyoming, South Carolina here over the last two months. And I can tell you consistently talking to Republican voters, there is a great many that still view Mike Pence uh, in the role of a traitor. Yeah. That he betrayed the country, that he didn't do the right thing on January 6th. And so what all of these testimonies here uh, are painting is perhaps an opening of a door to other Republican lawmakers, even those in Congress here, as right. the Republican Party at this very moment is determining how they want to step forward. Look, we may see Mike Pence become somebody that Republicans used to talk to swing voters who may believe he's got more, a lot more credibility than other more conservative folks from the Trump era. Carol Lennick, I want to talk about a, a little detail that I wonder if your ears perked up. You have done so much reporting on the Secret Service. It was interesting to me when, 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 we, when Mr. Jacobs was telling us a story about how Mike Pence did not want to leave the Capitol complex, and he basically said no. He goes, I trust you, but you know, you're not driving the car. Uh, explain what would have happened to that motorcade had he gotten in. So this is a really important moment to me too, Chuck, because we reported on it in our book, and the it, it's a it's very affirming that a mm -hmm. talented group of former federal prosecutors corroborated it and verified it. Uh, in that moment, Pence is whisked down against his will, honestly, down mm -hmm. to the basement, which we at one point referred to as a secure area because sources did not want us to describe where he was taken. Um, and he says, "Tim, I trust you." The head of his detail. Uh, but you're not the one driving the car. I'm not getting in that car. The importance of that is to That was a chilling. By the way, that was chilling to hear that. I, I don't know where your head went. I know where my, you know, one part of my, I was like, w I'd like a follow-up on that, Mr. Vice President. But anyway, go ahead, Carol. There are two things. You, you, you alight on an important moment. There are two things that are really important here. One, the Secret Service's number one job is to protect his life. He's part of the Octagon program. You know, if the president gets killed, the vice president is president. So part of that program is we save these people's lives. We protect their lives with our own. And getting him out of the Capitol actually would have normally been the right thing to do other than it was surrounded by people with nooses and flagpoles and weapons and bear spray. So getting him out of the building was not a foregone conclusion as the right security move. But the second and probably most important point here is 
Penson and his team were already on high alert, high suspicion about what is the president up to. And the president was pulling the levers of the Secret Service. The former detail leader was now the vice president the president's deputy chief of staff, and basically the boss of the Secret Service, and watching wow. carefully where Pence was. So Pence and his aide's suspicion, although that not their assumption, but their suspicion was Pence wants to finish the job, the Democratic job of certifying this election. And if he's whisked away indirectly at the order of the White House, that will block him from doing that job. And frankly, as I've said once or twice before, if Pence had done something different, anything different that day, if he hadn't been so determined to certify the election, Biden might not be president today. We might be in a very different situation as a country. Carol, you're, you're painting a picture of the, I'm not sure where they're gonna be driven. You, you sort of add to the suspicion I had when I first heard that, meaning they didn't know who the, a Secret Service agent felt like they had to listen to? I'm being generous here, meaning who was calling the shot? I mean, this sounds like a, a plot line out of one of those, you know, White House caper movies that we've seen every now and then where there's, you know, uh, people behind the scenes pulling strings. I mean, this is a chilling anecdote here, Carol. I want to be respectful and careful and honest about the facts. There was suspicion. That does not mean that President Trump was telling his deputy chief of staff, get Pence out of there. We don't know that. We don't right. have that evidence yet. Maybe the committee does. But the suspicion was based on completely rational facts in front of them. The president had put a target on the vice president's back. People yeah. were running through the building saying, let's hang him. And the president, after uh, multiple felonies have been committed. Police officers have been attacked by his supporters, and the building has been breached violently through broken glass and broken doors. After all that has happened, President Trump tweets that Mike Pence didn't have the courage. So there's plenty of reason for Pence to believe his life is in danger as a result of President Trump. And he doesn't know who to trust. Uh, Ali Vitale, Von Hillier, Chuck Rosenberg, and Carol Lennig, thank you all for getting us started to unpack this in our first part of this show. We're obviously going to stick with this topic coming up in a lot of ways. These hearings are what the second impeachment would have looked like had you had a year to investigate. I'm going to get reaction to today's hearing and the explosive testimony from one of those impeachment managers next and later. As I mentioned, we've got new reporting on why the January 6th committee now says they do need to speak to Jenny Thomas after claiming that they didn't, the wife of the Supreme Court Justice. How aggressive was she and how involved was she in this conspiracy to overturn the election? You're watching Meet the Press now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. When was the last time you made space to listen to somebody? What I learned from a very young age is radical love, radical forgiveness. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It showed a lot of personal strength for me. Why am I trying to make other people happy over myself? So many life lessons that are going on in these conversations. We're watching a transformation. Join Hoda Kotb for her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas is your news playlist on NBC News Now. And now, you can listen to it as a podcast. Available anytime and anywhere. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News, streaming free now.
from New Orleans late military operation witnessing the massive crowds. I admire you both. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Welcome back. Let's get a little more reaction to today's hearing from Capitol Hill. I'm joined by Democratic uh, member of Congress from Rhode Island, uh, David Sisson. He served as an impeachment manager for the second Trump impeachment trial on January 6th. And uh, Congressman, you know, this is the fourth official federal investigation of Donald Trump of his actions, either as president or, or in the run-up to being president. The Mueller report obstructed. The first impeachment obstructed. The second impeachment rushed. It was just is what it is. Um, tell me, I mean, if you had a year to investigate, is this the impeachment uh, case you would have been able to present a, 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 to the American public a year later? Well, I think there's no question, Chuck, that the Select Committee has done an extraordinary job in collecting evidence in a bipartisan way, you know, of over 1,000 witnesses, 140,000 documents. Uh, they've done an extraordinary job in assembling the evidence. Uh, I think in reality, it, you know, in our impeachment, no one who voted to uh, acquit the former president didn't uh, or argued that he didn't do uh, what we charged inciting an insurrection against the government of the United States. They all relied on this notion you can't impeach a former president. Uh, so I don't know that any of the facts would have changed their calculation, uh, but I think the select committee has done an extraordinary job of really beginning to lay out for the American people the events preceding January 6th, the, the financing and planning and execution of what was a really sophisticated scheme to keep the former president in office even though he lost the election. You know, it seems to me that the, the, the biggest uh, addition to the case that you guys made is the, is the more organized conspiracy to overturn the election, right? The Eastman memo, that this was a more concerted effort. Look, I know a lot of us look at Donald Trump and think, here's a guy that just says whatever at any moment. And I think we all sort of, you hate to say this, but if you've covered him long enough, you discount pretty much half of what he says all the time and all of what he says some of the time. But now when you see it put together, the fact that it was such a coordinated campaign in the month of December running into January 6th, um, that was something you guys didn't have uh, in, the, no, in, that, in that impeachment. How important would that have been? No, this is really critical evidence. I mean, if you remember, there was even some suggestion in the early days after January 6th that this was a group of supporters who just sort of got out of control and were overly enthusiastic. And of course, we knew it was nothing further from the truth, but we now know that this was very much planned, that at the very highest levels of the Trump administration, and including the president, they were aware that the president had lost the election, that there was no legal basis to keep him in office. And despite that, they expected and demanded that the former vice president president overrule the will of the people and keep Donald Trump in office. And they had an actual memo on how to do it and a number of conversations about it. It's, it's really shocking. And I think people shouldn't lose sight of the fact this is the president and his inner circle basically plotting to keep Donald Trump in office, though he lost the election fair and square. And they wanted to be able to have the vice president of the United States substitute his judgment for the judgment of the American people. There's nothing more antithetical to democracy than allowing a single person to overrule the, the voters in this country. And so this is really alarming stuff. So the, the decision about whether a crime was committed is going to be in the hands of the Justice Department. What is in your hands? I think after this committee is done and on, you're on the Judiciary Committee, is what changes to the Electoral Count Act need to be made to essentially create a few more guardrails, a few more safeguards? Uh, what have you heard and uh, in, in stuff that's been laid out that you think, okay, um, these are, this is at least one change I'd like to see? No, I think we all owe it to the Select Committee to obviously await their report and their conclusions. But I think it's very clear that although Every scholar I know who has reviewed it said that uh, the vice president's function is ministerial and, 
has to simply do what uh, the electoral, uh, what the voters uh, direct. Uh, maybe you can make that more explicit. I know there's been some suggestion that you can make what everyone understands to be the requirement that the vice president do that, um, that we could do that as well. But I think we, will, we should all wait for the full report from the select committee. I expect they'll make a set of recommendations. Um, obviously, one of the things I think is most important to make sure that the people who were involved in this attempted coup are accountable. I mean, that's one of the best ways you prevent it from happening again, is make sure people who planned it and executed it don't get away with it. Uh, and I think that's an important responsibility of the Department of Justice. I'm curious, where do you land on whether, if, there is, if, if this congressional committee believes a, a crime or multiple crimes were committed, whether they should do a formal criminal referral? I've seen all this hand-wringing well. Boy, if, it's a, if Congress puts pressure on the Justice Department, that looks political. Well, then others would argue, well, if you don't identify a crime, then what did you, what did you do the investigation for? Where do you come down on that debate? Look, I think this select committee has made referrals to the Department of Justice when people have defied their subpoenas. That's a responsibility they have in connection with the charge of the select committee to collect this evidence. I would expect that the Attorney General of the Department of Justice will ask the select committee to share with them what they've collected during the course of this investigation, and I would expect they would comply with that request. I think the judgment about whether or not criminal charges should be filed must rest with the Department of Justice, and the more that we can prevent any suggestion that politics played a role, the better. I think one of the great strengths of the Garland Justice Department is it's operating independently, free from politics. We should take no step which undermines that in any way, uh, but I hope that uh, the Attorney General will request all of the evidence collected by the Select Committee and then make the appropriate judgment based on that evidence. And by the way, there was one other thing that Mr. Jacobs said at one point. And it, this gets back to this Electoral Count Act business, where, and I think he brings up a good point, where, where someone said the Electoral Count Act might actually be unconstitutional in this respect. Should Congress have any role in this at all when it comes to deciding how the states certified or didn't certify? The states seem to have that sole power. So the idea of even objecting to a state certification doesn't seem to be constitutional. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question, but I think for, at the very least, the expectation is that what the states certify as their electors are received by the House and the joint session and the Electoral College, and that they're then communicated and recorded, and that the vice president doesn't independently get to make a judgment. Uh, but I think, you know, that's one of the reforms that I expect that we will look at when the select committee is done. But we shouldn't take our focus off what we're learning uh, in the yeah. presentation by the select committee. This is a breathtaking violation of our democracy and of our right to elect our own president and was executed and planned uh, with individuals at the highest levels of the Trump administration. And we should all sort of take note of that and recognize we can never allow this to happen again. No, it, it, is, it is a sophisticated criminal conspiracy, not, Absolutely. The key, not a sort of accidental rogue Keystone cop operation. Democratic Congressman David Cicilline of Rhode Island, uh, appreciate you coming on, sharing your perspective. My pleasure. Coming up, more on that controversial correspondence. Why Ginny Thomas, the wife of a Supreme Court justice and longtime conservative activist, and her emails are becoming a focal point in the January 6th investigation. One of the reporters behind that story joins me with the latest after a quick break. You're watching Meet the Press Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. Our players and coaches have been harmed. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. NBC News, streaming free now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. 
In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Welcome back. Let's turn back to what we mentioned at the top of the show. The January 6th committee now says they do want to hear from another key potential key witness, and that's Ginny Thomas, wife of the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. The Washington Post was the first to report that the select committee has obtained even more emails between Ginny Thomas, and this one is between John Eastman, the lawyer who's been the, the essentially the star of today's hearing, uh, in the role that he played in pressuring Mike Pence to not certify the election. Those emails between Eastman and Ginny Thomas show that she may have been a lot more involved in efforts to overturn the election than previously known. After the hearing, Chairman Benny Thompson told our Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale that the committee has already sent a letter to Jenny Thomas inviting her to speak with them. Jenny Thomas told the Daily Caller uh, that she looks forward to speaking with the committee and can't wait to clear up misconceptions. So the good news is it doesn't sound like they need a subpoena to get her to talk. Joined now by the Washington Post uh, a reporter on political investigations, Josh Dossie. He was one of the reporters on uh, uh, that uh, broke this story. So, Josh, let's start with, look, the, the Ginny Thomas emails, you know, the, you could have written, before today's scoop that you guys had with Eastman, you could explain those other emails away as an activist gone over the deep end a little bit. Uh, a little exuberant, all, you know, doing the, the mass emails and stuff like that. This seemed different, number one. And number two, where did, is this an email that now came from the release that the judge ordered from Eastman? Right. So what this shows is that John Eastman, who was orchestrating a lot of former President Trump's uh, legal strategy here as a hearing showed today, was in touch with Jenny Thomas. She was kind of simultaneously doing a multi-pronged campaign. My colleague Emma Brown reported on her reaching out to dozens of lawmakers in Arizona. She was reaching out to Mark Meadows and others in the White House. And she was in touch with uh, uh, John Eastman. And Mr. Eastman himself, actually, earlier today online, posted one of the emails where uh, he came and briefed her group on the electoral uh, efforts that he was undertaking. Uh, he posted that uh, with a, a denunciation of our story. But the email showed itself that they had been in touch and had done the meeting uh, about the election. So what it shows is in this frenzied period between November 3rd and January 6th, you have Jenny Thomas, who is working the inside and the outside game, uh, trying to help uh, get the election, uh, taking the results away of a free and fair election, and have it picked for President Trump. You know, I, look, I, 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 there's no reason for you to know anything beyond what, what, what we've learned, but the fact that John Eastman in this debate back and forth seems to imply at one point, hey, we need to hurry up and file this, uh, right. uh, uh, file this with the Supreme Court because there's, there's some infighting going on. There's a little bit of a dispute. Right. The implication is that he seems to know what's happening inside the court. It's not going to... It doesn't, you know, strain imagination to connect the dot to Ginny Thomas. Right, but we've not seen anything uh, concrete that would well would prove that. So I, I don't want to speculate on that. I of mean, Mr. Not. Eastman said today uh, in his post that he did online that he did not discuss with Ms. Thomas uh, anything about uh, the court or what the court was doing. Uh, but there's a there's a there's a number of emails that are from her that are about her, and we have not seen the sheer totality of those. What we do know, uh, Chuck, is that the committee, as they've uncovered more and more of these emails and gotten them, have now become more interested 
interested in Ginny Thomas. I mean, early on, they were telling uh, my colleague Jackie Alamani and me and others that while some of the emails she was sending were interesting, they viewed her basically as a sideshow and did not view her as central to the plot that they were trying to uncover here uh, as part of their investigatory work. And their position has now changed, uh, particularly Liz Cheney, who initially was quite opposed to having Jenny Thomas come in, uh, now supports that. Um, and you've seen several of the other members who previously told us uh, privately that they did not view it as a good use of their time um, have also changed their mind on that. And Benny Thompson came out today and said uh, that they do want her in. So what we know is that there are more emails than we than we previously were believe there were, that she was more deeply involved in the president's efforts and talking to folks in the president's orbit right. than we knew, and that the committee is more interested her in her after this last tranche of emails than they were previously. And Josh, just to confirm, and we know that there was at least one, there is, that, the, that Clarence Thomas did have to rule on at least one election challenge, and, right. and, he, it, and he came down uh, on the side of Trump, which in hindsight doesn't, it's not a good look right now. Uh, he did come down on the side of Trump, that's correct, on that election challenge, and has been very vociferous that, um, you know, allies of his have been very vociferous that a recusal was not necessary there, uh, and and he did not recuse himself and has not shown any willingness to recuse himself on anything in, in the future, um, saying that it's no. unnecessary. There is nothing in the law that demands it. Josh Dossie uh, with The Washington Post, uh, terrific reporting. Josh, thanks. We turn now to a panel that we've put together here, a little big picture of what we got from today's hearings. What comes next? What could be the political impact of today's testimony? I'm joined by Commentary Magazine editor Noah Rothman and former New York Democratic Party executive director Basil uh, Smichel. Let me uh, start with this sort of montage that came from the committee, Noah, because I'm wondering, in the same way we were shocked when we saw Tom Rice end up voting to impeach you, like, whoa, where did that come from? I'm wondering if this moment is going to create that sort of epiphany for some elected Republicans. Number two, guys. Did you hear any part of the phone call, even if just this, the end that the president was speaking from? I did, yes. All right, and what did you hear? So as I was dropping off the note, um, I, I, my memory, I remember hearing the word wimp. Either he called him a wimp. I don't remember if he said, you are a wimp, you'll be a wimp. Wimp is the word I remember. It's also been reported that the president said to the vice president that something to the effect of you don't have the courage to make a hard decision. Worse, I don't remember exactly either, but something like that, yeah. Do you? Being a, you like being, you're not tough enough to make the call. It was a different tone than I'd heard him take um, with the vice president before. The word that she relayed to that the president called the vice president, I apologize for being impolite, but do you rem remember what she said her father called him? The P word. So what's important here, I do think the timing is important here. So that was at approximately 11 o'clock on January 6th. Here he is about an hour later, and here's how others reacted to what he said about Pence. Take a listen. Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution and for the good of our country. And if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you, I will tell you right now. I'm telling you what, I'm hearing the Pence. I hear the Pence just caved. No. Is that true? I didn't I'm, hear, I'm hearing no. reports the Pence caved. No I'm way. telling you, if Pence caved, we're going to drag no. through the streets. You no. politicians are going to get through the streets. Yes. I guess the hope is that there's such a show of force here that Pence will decide to just do the right show. thing, according to Trump. Republican in good standing can somehow stand by Trump after all this? So in the wake of the immediate aftermath of the violence of January 6th, you saw some very conscious addled members, Senator Lankford refusing to um, con contest the results of these states. And Congressman Rice is an interesting case because he was one of these guys who wanted to contest the results and yet voted to impeach um, because probably he was moved by what he experienced on that day. Primaries so far have presented a mixed bag when it comes to Trump, right? You can get crosswise with him, but it's survivable, mm -hmm. with the exception 
of January 6. If you have at any point suggested that the president shares culpability for those events, it's a death knell for your political career. But this, I will say this, Noah, though, this is, because here's the thing, on January 6 itself, I, none of us fully understood the coordinated pressure campaign that, was, that Mike Pence was under at that time. And it looked like what we thought it was, Basil, right, which was simply, maybe it was a whole bunch of supporters that went haywire. But as you start to hear yeah. the testimony and, and everything is being played out, I call it what I have been over the last few weeks. It's a big conspiracy, perhaps a big criminal conspiracy, not just a big lie. Because anyone that knows campaigns, the infrastructure that's involved in getting candidates and electeds on the same page in their messaging to put money, resources on the ground. I had a police officer stop me on the way over here because he recognized me and he said, I saw that member of Congress. Uh, leading those folks on a tour, taking pictures. That looked like a reconnaissance uh, activity. They knew what was happening. So when you put all of these things together, there's no way that you can come away from this saying that any of this wasn't coordinated. And the question now is, do we reflect on this the way I reflected or many of my, my peers reflected when we were growing up in the 80s when we heard that how close we were to a nuclear war under Kennedy? Are we going to reflect on how close we were to an actual revolution and overthrow of our government after all is said and done here? I guess, no, what my point is, is are we going to see somebody, like, look, I, I hear you with the voters, right? The voters, we don't know. And I'm not, I'm just wondering if there are going to be more elected officials that are just like, whoa, right. I just, I got to get off the Trump train. You would hope something like this transcends partisan politics. Um, if you have, if you convince yourself of your necessity, you're one of the smart ones, you're one of the sane ones, the mm -hmm. person coming up behind you is the guy you got to fear, then you can rationalize your way into ignoring what we've been privy to. There's conspiracy elements here quite clearly. The notion here that this was somehow uh, really well planned and coordinated strikes me as, as hard to prove, especially since Eastman himself apparently confessed in testi testimony from Mr. Hirschman that he didn't even believe his plan would succeed under the scrutiny of the courts. It, it, they were throwing things at the wall. Now, that's egregious. And they have, there are clear indications that they're going to run this again in 2024 in a much more orchestrated and, and, and contrived fashion. But we should be careful about the extent to which we have seen some sort of a vast conspiracy unfold here. It looks like they were throwing stuff at the wall to see what would stick. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that. I, I don't, I don't think that optimistically about what happened. I don't believe that this was just accidental or just stupidness. This is my, as my Jamaican grandmother would say, pure foolishness. It wasn't that. To me, there, there was something larger at play here, and maybe it stops at Donald Trump, and I think it does. Um, but to me, there's no way that you can have this big lie, if you will, and that you have candidates on the same page, you have elected officials on the same page, that you have a, a, a spouse of a justice of the Supreme Court making calls and sending emails, that there is, there's no way that any of this is happening without some larger conversation about how all of this is going to be pulled together and what the ultimate outcome could or should be, in my view. What's your sense of where Pence, can Pence have a future? And is it sort of, does he get a weight? Is this one of those things he's got to let history catch up to him? I hope he tries to uh, charge headlong into what I believe is a buzzsaw. Uh, I don't you think do. it's survivable. Yeah. But I do think that he's demonstrated with his bravery on the day of and subsequently speaking about this in very clear, unnuanced terms without trying to spare the feelings mm -hmm. of those who perceive themselves to be as persecuted as they think Donald Trump is being persecuted now. Mm -hmm. He's been very brave in that sense. And I do hope he, he when, and if he mounts a campaign in 2024, he doesn't run away from these events and confronts the Republican electorate with what could have happened. Because as we've learned and uncovered in these hearings, the Republican Party is, does have a fealty to the Constitution. Conservatives have a fealty to the Constitution. What we saw was an attack on the Constitution. And that's a really hard thing to rationalize, rationalize yourself around. Even if you have this abiding affection for Donald Trump and a sense of your own persecution, that cuts through the noise. Basil, is Mike Pence a hero? You know, interestingly enough, I was thinking about him today, and I said, how do I find Mike Pence to be somewhat of a sympathetic figure today? But I find myself thinking that to some extent. Um, you know, I don't know that he's a hero. Would not go that far to, to say that. But to your point, if he somehow decides that he wants to try to, to, to bring the Republican Party to a place that it hasn't been for the last four years, take it in another direction, if he does that, if he becomes that kind of leader, then I think he can garner the respect of more sort of folks across the political aisle. But today, 
I don't know that that is going to be a widespread belief among Democrats or independents because they're still watching this unfold. They're still trying to figure out, you know, how, how much fealty was he showing to Donald Trump even in those final moments? I will say this. I think you're going to start seeing Mike Pence show up for Republicans campaigning in blue states. Uh, <laughs> we used to see Rudy Giuliani, who you will no longer see for or, helping Republicans in right. blue or purple states. Anyway, Noah, Basil, good to see you both. Uh, thanks for your perspective. We're going to switch gears a little bit here after the break. Turn to some developing news out of Ukraine. New NBC reporting that President Biden told two of his most prominent cabinet members to now tone it down when it came to the rhetoric against Russia. The latest from the ground in Kyiv next. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour?